From the mountains of central British Columbia to you listening around the world, this, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. We welcome you to tonight's show, including Kingdom of Nye Radio and Revolution Radio. If you want to take a listen to our archives, they are free at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, shop at the SOR vault and get yourself a Spaced Out Radio t-shirt. Sign up for the SOR Newswire, read up on We Own the Night, or We Read the Night, that is, our new book section. And read up on the SOR Newswire by Captain Shirk as well. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by donating to Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. Tonight, with it being about a week before Halloween, I figured it would be great to bring on Ross Allison for some awesome ghost stories. Ross is the creator and team lead of A Ghost, a paranormal organization of Seattle, Washington. In Seattle, Ross has become a leader of the paranormal with one of the most popular ghost tours in the country, which includes touring the USS Tuner Joy. Also, Ross owns one of the best tourist attractions in Seattle with the Death Museum, a collection of haunted objects and stories that will blow your mind then at the bottom of hour number three i will bring you the sor newswire brought to you by paranoia magazine ross it's been a while since we had you on the show but we always love it when you are on how you been my friend i've been good how you been I've been doing really good i'm getting ready for halloween you know i feel a little guilty as a dad here because my son still doesn't have a Halloween costume. He's not sure what he wants to be. Uh-oh. And we're like, you know, you got six shopping days left. And it's like, man, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And I'm still, still trying to figure it out, huh? <laughs> Bud, I have, have no have idea. Have like you throw a bunch of ideas in a hat and have him draw it out and say, you're going with that, buddy? <laughs> well, you know what? He the one thing is like 2 years ago he was Optimus Prime. And then last year he was Bumblebee. And because he loves his Transformers. Oh, and that's awesome. I do. Oh yeah, but we had the good ones, the old school ones that still were pretty awesome. I mean, the new ones are a little bit more complicated. Try transforming them today, man. That's all I got to say. My son has so many Transformers, and he and he gets them, and he because my my parents will spoil them. You know, every time he's down seeing Grandpa, Grandpa takes him down to Walmart to get a new Transformer toy, and then he expects me to transform it. Man, I got better luck solving a Hanayama ten out of ten puzzle than I do transforming one of these <laughs> these days, man. I hear you. I hear you. Toys are, you know, to be honest with you, they're kind of amazing now, you know? I know. So much more complicated. Those tiny little pieces now that surely you would choke to death on. But uh, I tell you, it's just like I'm kind of envious of a lot of these toys that kids get today. Well, you know what? They still will never have the fun of dodging lawn darts. (laughs) Oh, yes, I remember lawn darts. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Illegal everywhere, but that's okay. <laughs> now, Ro- Ross, you're over on the East Coast, and I didn't know that every year for the last 15, 16 years, you fly out to the East Coast to do a haunted story tour. What's this all about? Oh, yeah. I'm not just the East Coast. I'm all over the U.S. Uh, I lecture at colleges and universities on my uh, lecture on Ghostology 101. And I just, you know, take the students. I do an hour presentation at the college, and then I take them on a ghost hunt at their campus. So I get to hear all kinds of crazy ghost stories in some of these uh, campuses and get to do like a little mini investigation. So it's been a lot of fun. In 2019... And even going into last year, twenty late 2018, Ross, your name really took off in the paranormal field as one of the prominent voices of the paranormal. And and I know you're probably way too humble to, to even want to answer this question, but I'm going to ask you anyways. When it comes to people like yourself, David Weatherly, John Tenney, people who are in that upper echelon of paranormal investigation, you guys seem to always stay away from the drama, always stay away from the BS that seems to haunt this field, pun intended. 
how do you make it into there? Because there are so many people who would love to be in your shoes. Well, you know, for me, I think my success is I, I've always been open and honest. You know, there's a lot of people out there that, uh, and, I, and I know it's unfortunate, sometimes they do get a lot of attention, you know, for the stories that they make up. And uh, for me, it's just, it's always about being the honest individual. You know, I will debunk things if I, I can debunk it, and I'll call bullshit, you know, if if I believe it's bullshit. It's, it's, it's a tough field to be in because it has now become so competitive. You know, it's like I remember back in the day when I started my organization back in 2000, we were one out of 100 nationally. And now each state can easily have 100-plus groups. So, and, and because of the, the new hype, and just recently uh, there's been a new hype in ghost hunting because of the networks, you know, looking for new ghost hunting shows. And so now everybody's out there, you know, stabbing everybody in the back, you know, just trying to get their foot in the door to be on these shows. So oh, you, yeah. you have to deal with a lot of that uh, as well. And, and I, for me, it's just, um, I stay focused on what I'm supposed to be doing. I, you know, I was doing this before the television shows. So that was never even an idea when I came into the field, you know? So I just, you know, I, I enjoy writing the books. I enjoy lecturing. I enjoy you know, teaching the classes. I enjoy doing the tours. And for me, it's all about my main goal is to educate people as to what's really happening out there. And I think people have appreciated that. Well, I think so, too, because you're right. There are an influx of shows. Television has really uh, fallen in love with this topic. Maybe not the topic in general, but the ratings and the money that generates through advertising. And you cannot blame the television networks doing this. It's actually kind of funny that you bring up the whole ego part, because this past Monday, I actually had to change a guest. I have the, had this guest scheduled, and I'm not going to mention his name. His television show just got picked up, and we had been talking for about a month, and mm -hmm. he knew the time, he knew the length of the interview, he knew absolutely everything. And then the, a couple hours before showtime, his publicist reaches out to me and says, well, probably it was a few days, a couple days before, his publicist reaches out to me and says, yeah, he can't do an interview that long. He only has 30 minutes to an hour that he wants to do. And I'm like, no, he agreed to two and a half hours, and we're going to do two and a half hours. And I said, actually, it's only about two hours if you include the breaks. And so she gets back to me and she says, oh, well, he has a flight to catch in the evening, and he can't stay on that late. I said, sure. I said, you know what? We're just not going to do this. How about that? I said, this is enough time wasting. Our audience is important. They don't deserve to be railroaded by a guest like this. I've never allowed it. I'm not going to start now for somebody who is reeking of ego right now because his show got picked up. So I ended up dumping it. I did, and I, and I, wow. don't, even feel, I don't even feel bad about it. But it just goes to show, like you were saying, Ross, this ego trip for everybody trying to become... Uh, the next television star in the paranormal is is real and it is rampant right now. It is. It, it's really gotten ugly out there, and it, and it's kind of sad because it, it really does discredit what we're trying to do as well. But you know what can you do? It's uh, the television shows, the networks are going to basically run run it how they want to and lead everybody down the wrong path as to what's really going on out there in the paranormal field. Well, you mentioned the television shows and, and the say that they have. You have worked on a number of these now. And mm -hmm. when you look at these television shows, I mean, are they a necessary evil for somebody like you? Yes, you're not. You're, you're just getting into that realm. You've been uh, had pieces of yourself on, on different shows is what I'm trying to say. Is it different now that you've you've done a few comparatively to when you started? Because I would look at it as a necessary evil. You have to get on there to get your name out, to get your tour out there, to talk about Mr. Creepy the doll and all of this comparatively to when it was before. 
and you're just trying to build your name through social media and maybe sell a book or two. And, and you're and you're right. It, it's a, a catch twenty two because some of these shows you you really don't want to do. Uh, because of the reputation of the shows, because they do get out. Um, and then you, you're right. You, you do want to get out there and at least let people know that you are out there doing this kind of work and research. You know, the, the sad thing is, is you see, uh, you know, the thing is, is a lot of these people that, you know, get out there and try to be on these television shows or get their own shows, they make all these claims. But if you ever do any research on them, there's nothing to back it up, you know. And again, I'm not going to say any names, but there's a lot of these people that don't even go beyond, you know, the the original hype of you know ghost hunting shows, which was in 2004 when Ghost Hunters aired. So if you try to look up any of these people to have any history, and they say, "Oh, I've been doing this, you know, 30, 40 years," but yet you look them up, there's there's nothing to back any of that up. You know, so that's kind of frustrating because, you know, me and David, you know, Weatherly have, you know, have had this talk many, many times because, you know, even David Weatherly, who's been out there, you know, 40, you know, plus years doing this work and he can prove that, you know, and he gets overlooked by a lot of these, you know, networks, or, you know, production companies when I feel he should be out there, you know, representing us on these shows. There's a lot of Absolutely. great people that should be out there representing us, but you get these people that, you know, are like, you know, in their early 20s and, you know, claiming, oh, I've been doing this all my life. And yet you can't find any information about them. And and yet they're getting, you know, the, this this label as being, you know, professional ghost hunter when they probably only been doing, you know, maybe five, you know, maybe even at 10 years at the most. I am so actually it, really it, surprised at that, that about David. Honestly, David yeah. Weatherly, you know, we've everybody on our audience knows, unless they're new, we've had David on here numerous, numerous times, and he is a big, big supporter of what we do here, and very, very honored to be able to call him a friend. But when you take a guy like David Weatherly, or John Tenney, for that instance, how those two David do Lloyd not Arbach, have, you know? Yeah, or Lloyd Arbach, there's another one. How they don't have, like, back-to-back-to-back shows to absolutely destroy the paranormal field and what it is, it's incredible. I mean, all any network needs is one of those three on there to really bring the next, you know, the 2019-2020 version of In Search Of. Right. You know, and it's sad, and it's it's one of those things that they really want to push the sensationalism of ghost hunting. They want people, and it in it's it's the biggest problem is you know the the production companies that go out and search for ghost hunters. Most of the time, you know, they're just posting an ad on a casting you know site. You know, looking for anybody that's interested in the paranormal, and anybody could uh, apply for that. And then if you have the the attitude that they're looking for, well, you're now the next professional ghost hunter. And that's what it's been like, you know, for the past what? How long have these shows been on now? Fifteen years now. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, you're abs- and, and that's how it works. And nobody's trying to get the answers. I think the last show that was actually trying to figure out some sort of answers when we, when remember Bill Burns had his UFO hunters show where he was really oh, yeah. starting to pu- push the limits and they were number one in, in their time slot and number one on the cable networks. And then they got a little too close. To, he Bill believes they got a little too close to something, and some men in men in black came up to him and said, "You know, say what you want to say because we're we're getting you canceled for the following year." And they were canceled. I wow. mean, if you believe that, which Bill tells mm-hmm. a, a fantastic story, but I mean, nobody seems to want to solve anything. It's all about get, uh, filming people getting scared for no reason, right? Right. Well, you know, the, the sad thing is, is, you know, if you look at a lot of these shows, it's all the same exact thing over and over and over again. No one's doing anything different. You know, no one's applying, you know, real science to this. No one's, you know, 
doing the real research, it's just the same thing over and over and over again. And that's what's frustrating it too. And I think I would like to think that the audience that watches a lot of these shows are kind of getting bored with it. They're, uh, well, apparently the ratings say they're not, which is incredible. But nonetheless, what are you filming these days? What are you working on? I know I, I know you uh, following you and stalking <laughs> you on social media. I, I know you're getting in front of the camera. I, I'm kind of doing my own thing. I, I found out, you know, just through, you know, all the recent, you know, adventures I've been on and appearing in a lot of these shows that, you know, if you really want to make your research true, you kind of have to do it on your own. You, you can't trust these production companies or these, you know, networks because they will, you know, alter things to, you know, make it better for them or what they want their audience to see. And I think, it, I think it, in all honesty, you just kind of have to do your own thing. So that's what I'm doing. I'm just kind of filming some interesting research that I'm doing, and uh, hopefully I'll be able to get it out there soon. Well, that would be very, very cool because I would be very interested in seeing what you get. And like I said, I have investigated with you only once, and that was up here last year. And I got to tell you, man, the barn is still red hot. The barn is no, still I definitely red. love to come back. <laughs> oh, you're more than welcome to. You are more than welcome to any time. You know that. But, you know, watching you up on that catwalk get get freaked out. So I got I, we got to paint the picture here. So Ross is up here last year with David Weatherly, and, and we're doing a paranormal investigation at the museum I always talk about. We're in the big Clydesdale barn on the second floor where we got the guy on the stairs and we go up the stairs and I'm carrying a camera and Ross all of a sudden, okay, you got to say what, what you saw there. That was phenomenal. All right. So yeah, so we're on this catwalk again, completely dark, pitch dark. Um, we're just, you know, filming infrared, you know, taking pictures and you're telling me that, Oh, I think I see him down there. He's down there. He's down there. So I'm the one probably closest to whatever it is you're, you're seeing. And so I turn around to kind of, you know, quickly take a picture because it seems like sometimes the best time to actually capture the phenomena is when they're not expecting it. So I quickly turn around to take a picture and right in the flash, I saw the silhouette of a man standing right in front of me. And you do have it on video. I screamed. <laughs> <laughs> and I totally jumped back. Because I, clearly, I saw the outline of a man standing right in front of me, right in that flash. Yeah. Yeah, he's pretty good. He is very, very good. And, you know, uh, it, <laughs> watching that experience, I, I remember I was just killing myself laughing, you know, after making sure you were okay, because I know the dangers of that guy up on the stairwell there. And all too well, I mean, being attacked by him once before. But, wow. I mean, it, I mean, it just goes to show how real this phenomena really is, Ross. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and, it, and it's funny, too, because a lot of times you, you do a lot of investigations, you know, when you're in this field. I, I, I would say, you know, we can easily average, you know, four or five investigations a month, you know, going out there and doing this. And a lot of people don't seem to realize. And again, going back to the television shows, you know, how they sensationalize everything. It's all about being at the right place at the right time. So you don't always have those experiences. So most of the time, you know, it, it, it can be pretty boring for a lot of people going out there ghost hunting, you know, sitting around waiting in the dark for something to happen, and it doesn't always happen. But to have those unique experiences, those startling moments, it's just like it really gets that blood going, and it's like, yeah, there is something to this. It, it helps to relieve all that doubt. Like, you, sometimes you second-guess yourself, like, did I really have that experience? Did I really hear that noise? Did I really think I saw something, you know, go around the corner? But when you have those unique experiences, like I saw somebody standing right in front of me in that, you know, that split second, it's like, it makes it all worth it. It's like, wow, that's great. Russ, you were one of the very few, as we have about three minutes here before we go to break at the bottom of the hour. You're one of the very few who has been able to 
you know, carve out a niche or a career in the paranormal, which many people out there, myself included, would love to be able to do and do it full time where where, you know, Yes, our scenarios are quite different, but you're traveling across the country, giving lectures, being invited on television shows to speak at conferences. You have your own haunted tour that you do that's very successful in Seattle and many, many other projects. How have you been able to kind of break that trend of people saying, you know, there's no way you can make a career in the paranormal, and yet here you have? Well, I'm one of the few lucky people, I should say, because I, I stayed focused on what I wanted to do. The, the, the thing is, is you know, it's it, it, it is hard because I never expected to be the only full time ghost hunter in the Northwest. You know, I never expected that. You know, um, but. I stayed focused on it because there's a lot of people, and I meet a lot of people that you know come up to me and say, "Oh yeah, I'm going to write a book." And, then they never write the book, you know, or, you know, I'm going to do my own, you know, documentary series and they never do it. You know, a lot of people, you know, have these visions, these dreams that they want to do this, but they don't follow through for whatever reasons. And, and life is complicated. You know, people have families, jobs that they have to, you know, compete with and you don't always have that freedom. You know, I pretty much, you know, my life is pretty much almost like a single guy, you know, so I, I don't have a lot of the, the complications that most people have. So for me, I think that helped quite a bit, uh, freeing up my time and then just staying focused on what I wanted to do. So when I said I was going to write a book, I wrote the book and then it became two books and now it's you know up to seven books and i continue to work with david weatherly where you know got more books coming out so it's been a lot of that and then you know going out and doing you know ghost tours everywhere because i loved ghost tours and then realizing well you know maybe i should do my own ghost tour in seattle and, and that really you know took off as well but one of the things you know i i definitely like to clear up is you know people think you know there's just tons and tons of money when you do this and no you know, I'm paycheck to paycheck. I struggle like most people do, you know, to, to make ends meet. But, you know, I, I stayed focused on what I wanted to do. And I made a lot of sacrifices to be where I am today. And, you know, if it's, you know, making a paycheck to paycheck, then I'll continue to do that because I love doing what I do. And I think it's the passion that drives me the most. Ross Allison is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio, and there's only one thing that I will guarantee, besides we're going to have some great stories tonight on the show, I can guarantee you, without even asking Ross, that he's wearing a t-shirt that has a minimum of five skulls on it. That's what I do know. More Ross Allison and Ghost Stories on Spaced Out Radio coming up. Hey, space travelers, this is John Resig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. If you know anything about our website, you know we like to do things a little differently. We're not some faceless organization collecting money for a nebulous cause. Our donor dollars go directly toward life-improving items. Then we give those items directly to an underdog who needs it most. To become a donor with Spaced Out Radio's official charity, Chive Charities, just go to chivecharities.org forward slash donate. From the heartlands of Canada to beards around the world, we know how to take care of you. Fill your follicles with the Mighty Moose Beard Oil. All our oils and balms are handmade and 100% natural ingredients because we care about your beard. And hey, use the promo code SOR2019 and get your Mighty Moose Beard Oil today. You can check us out on our website, MightyMooseBeard.com. Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. 
Finish off your weekend and kick off your new week with me, Everett Themer, right here on Spaced Out Sundays. I'm going to bring you great guests, a little bit of snark, and plenty of information to think about. But don't worry, there's going to be plenty of woo as well. We are going to hit everything in the paranormal and supernatural, including the odd psychic Sundays. So tune us in on Sunday, 9.06 p.m. Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern, right here at spacedoutradio.com. Heading to Vancouver and looking for a night on the town? The Moose Vancouver is the bar that never stops rocking until 2 a.m. every night. The Moose has great food with everything on the menu from $6.95 to $8.95. Fantastic, vibrant staff and rock and roll that will bring you back to when the music was real, the hair was long, and the guitars were rocking. Get your party on at the Moose Vancouver, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. Every night on Space Out Radio, we have places for you to hang out. Hi, this is Carl. Join our SOR Space Travelers group on Facebook for live chat. On Twitter, using hashtag Spaced Out Radio, you can also join us in our Spreaker chat room. Check us out on Instagram at Dave Scott SOR. All of our archives are free on YouTube at Spaced Out Radio. By the way, I'll be watching you at your window until you do. Bye! We're adding to the entertainment online for Spaced Out Radio. I'm Amber Beckard, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out Cryptid Tales, where I will take you on a journey into some of the strangest legends and lore from around the world, relaying the stories to you of the strange creatures and experiences that people have had throughout time. You can find Cryptid Tales at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our free archives and leave a comment. See you there. Are you having encounters with the paranormal, supernatural, or ufological that you cannot explain? Look no further than the SOR Sightlines Report, brought to you by the Experiencers Support Association. This is Ryan Stacy, head of the Research Association, TESSA. Soon on the Spaced Out Radio website, you will be able to file your reports and have them researched for you. We are independent and ready to help Spaced Out Radio listeners today. Move over, brother! And let me own Saturday night. This is Rich Giordano, and I'm inviting you to tune on in to Spaced Out Saturday starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, 12 a.m. Eastern, where I'm going to bust open the lids on everything paranormal. Why? Because we want answers, and I'm the guy who's going to deliver those answers to you. Join the chat rooms, and we'll see you this Saturday. Just be there. No, really. Hey everybody, the SOR Space Travelers is open. For just five bucks a month, you can hang out with Dave and our crew privately in our members-only section. With your signing, you'll receive newsletters on what's going on with Spaced Out Radio. You'll have direct contact with the host during the show in our chat, live streaming videos, and a great forum for your posts and more. Become a space traveler now at spacedoutradio.com. You wanted new SOR gear, and now you can have it. The SOR Vault is fully stocked with t-shirts, hats, hoodies, mugs, and everything in between with great logos for you to choose from. So head on over to spacedoutradio.com, click on the SOR Vault, and go shopping. Pricing is quite affordable, and you can look good representing your favorite show. So go to our website and pick up your new SOR wear at the SOR Vault today. Looking for something new to push your limits? Look Beyond the Spectrum, a new docuseries featuring some of the best researchers in the world when it comes to everything from UFOs, government cover-ups, and Bigfoot in the forest. Truth seekers like Steve Bassett, Dr. Jeff Meldrum, Richard Dolan, as well as others all chip in to bring their knowledge to you. Beyond the Spectrum can be found on Amazon as well as Tubi TV. Tell us what you think on our Amazon page. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. Hey, 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 hey. 
Welcome back to the second half hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. Thank you so much for coming along for the ride. Really do appreciate that. Want to remind you, if you've missed portions of this show or others, you can always go to our YouTube channel and listen to our archives for free at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, and boy, do we have a plethora of features for you. Read up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Hang out and listen to Bumblefoot. You can shop at the Spaced Out Radio SOR Vault. Check out the book lineup we got on We Read the Night and join the SOR Space Travelers Club as well, all at spacedoutradio.com. Ghost stories tonight as we are a week away from Halloween, and we got one of the best storytellers on the air with us here, paranormal investigator Ross Allison out of Seattle. You've got to check out his death museum when you are down in the Emerald City. Ross, welcome back. Well, it's great to be back. Oh, no worries, man. No worries. You know, it's it's absolutely amazing that you took time for us tonight because, you know, I know this is your busy time of your season, getting all hopped up and, and ready for Halloween. People want to hear some very spooky stories, and it really is a wear and tear on the body. October is for people such as you, David Weatherly, and others, you know, when you are looking for stories, because you always have to keep things fresh and new when you do your tours, how do you do that? What are you looking for in a good story? Well, a lot of it, uh, for me, uh, usually starts with the evidence. People like to see the evidence. You know, you could you could tell ghost stories till you're blue in the face. And there's a lot of great ones out there, but when you have something to support that experience. I think that is one of your, your biggest advantages when it comes to, to storytelling today. I think people really love to see what these, you know, entities are capable of doing. So for me, when I'm basing a story, I, I really, I start with the evidence, what evidence has been collected and then kind of go from there. So I think, I think for me, that is the, the first step. So when you're looking for stories, are you looking for human interest stories that involve people? Or are you looking for older hauntings that have been hallowed throughout the decades? What are you looking for? Well, uh, for me, a uh, story, it's just like writing a book. You know, you got to have your big, your beginning, your middle, and your end. So I always love the fact that when you can have personal experiences involved, that's always a, a plus. Um, I love to have the elements of, you know, the, the, the human being, um, I want to have, you know, scare is great. You know, if you can make it scary or if it, you know, if it's scarier, that's even better. But, um, I think the fact that, you know, people like to hear about the stories of that, they, that they know are real people, um, especially in a situation like, um, uh, Marion Zoinchek. We have a place in Seattle um, called the Elks Club. And Marion Zoinchek was actually a mayor of uh, Seattle. Uh, and he was actually a state representative, too, uh, of Washington. So he had uh, access to going out to Washington, D.C. to represent uh, the state of Washington. And apparently, Marion Zoinchek was a, a kook. You know, the best way to say it, you know, especially for the time. Um, he was one of those guys that, you know, was an alcoholic. Uh, he was known to party a lot. And when he got drunk, he would, you know, be seen, you know, dancing in the fountains. Um, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff. You know, when he'd go to, you know, fancy you know, dinner parties, he would be at the you know, dinner table lapping up soup like a dog. And, um, and it is just one of those, one of those guys who just got a lot of media attention for the crazy stuff that he was doing. And this continued on, you know, for a few years. And then it just got to the point where, you know, people were like, you know, tired of it. It's like this, you know, you're representing us and you're, you know, acting like a fool. So one of his friends decided to run against him. And this, you know, really ticked him off. Now, he had at the time in office what was known as, it was a gentleman's club. Um, 
and that is now known as the the Art Club in Seattle. So this in the beginning times was a gentleman's club, and so he had an office on the fourth floor. And when he found out that his friend was running against him, this really upset him. And so one day, his uh, his brother in law and his wife had drove up, you know, pulled up alongside the building in the car. His brother-in-law got out of the car to go get him. They were going to pick him up for, for lunch. And as she was waiting in the car, all of a sudden she hears screaming and this loud thud right next to her car. Opens the door, and here it is. Her husband had jumped from the fourth floor and landed right next to the car. Oh, goodness. Oh, yeah. Uh, tragic story. Tragic story. But then, now, today, they do believe that Marion haunts the Art Club. Now, the reason why they feel he haunts the Art Club is because no one knows exactly what happened. Was this suicide? Or was this actual murder? And there's all kinds of interesting stories out there as to, you know, a lot of people had it out for him. You know, his brother-in-law had it out for him. And so his brother-in-law, his story was that right when he walked into the office, he saw Marion in the window and then leapt. But then there are stories that maybe he was pushed out the window. All kinds of stuff. So this is an unsolved mystery. And so they believe because his death was never solved, they believe that he is actually haunting the location. And there are stories, you know, where people will get into the elevator at the Arctic Club and they'll piss, piss, push the button for the sixth floor and the, the elevator will just take you to the fourth floor and stop. And doors will open, no one's there. No one called for the elevator. And then it'll go back down. And then you push the sixth floor again. And then finally it'll go up to the sixth floor. But the, one of the, my favorite stories is this boring. She, you know, she gets to the hotel because it's a hotel now and um, she, you know, gets her room key and she, you know, gets into the elevator and she you know, goes to the floor, hits the button for the floor and it's just her alone in the elevator. And by the time the elevator got to her floor and the doors open, she came running down the stairs back to the, the, the desk, the front desk. And she was terrified. She said that when she was in that elevator, all she could hear was like somebody was yelling at her. Some male voice was yelling at her. And of course, there's no one else in the elevator. And she just checked out and was done. But there are people that will actually hear a gentleman whistling around on the fourth floor um, in the room that used to be his office has now been divided up and I believe four guest rooms now. Um, people have actually had experiences in those rooms where, you know, things will turn on and off by themselves. They'll set something down on the nightstand and then go back to go grab it and it's gone and it'll show up under the bed and just all kinds of, you know, funky things like that. So for me, I think a story is important when it actually is based off a real individual. No, I can't say that it's definitely Marion haunting location. You know, that place has had all kinds of individuals in and out of it, you know, throughout the decades. But, you know, it, it's nice when you have that, you know, that, that story that ties it into an actual individual and their crazy antics to support the fact that maybe this is Marion. It's interesting that it's happening on the fourth floor. This is where he jumped from. How would you go about proving it? Because everybody always wants proof. What would you need in order to say that is the ghost of Marion? Well, as you know, the years have gone by, there have been people that claim to see the apparition, and they do claim that it does look like, you know, Marion. Um, but for me, I think, you know, it, it's hopefully we have the opportunity to investigate the location as well. So that we can do our own, you know, research to find out if it is that individual. Um, so that's always, you know, nice to to have. EVPs are always great when you you ask those questions and you get a direct answer as to who it is. But in in most cases, and I'll be honest with you, in most cases we are making assumptions. You know, we're we're assuming that you know just because so and so died here or so and so was murdered here or 
you know, just because this person was popular, that person might be the ghost. And I think we do have to put a little more research into a lot of these, you know, stories to find out what that, who that could be. And that's one of the reasons why I write a lot of these books with David Weatherly is because we are trying to, even in a lot of cases, I find myself debunking a lot of the claims when someone says, oh, it's so-and-so. Well, then as you do research, you find out, well, so-and-so never stayed there, you know? So it's a lot of that. But um, I think, you know, in trying to collect the evidence, it is a struggle. You you are still trying to figure out, you know, who it is haunting these locations. You know, another prime example is um, the USS Turner Joy. It is a retired Navy destroyer in Bremerton, Washington. And there is a tragic story to that ship where three men were killed when they had a misfire. And and what that is is, you know, when the, the, the gun goes off and, of course, it didn't, uh, they're not sure of what happened or if the the, the the, the bullet, they all made it out of the barrel or not. Um, so what they have to do is um, there's a certain protocol that they have to follow. One of those is they'll actually, you know, hose down the barrel of the gun to cool it off. And then they'll actually put a small charge in the barrel of the gun. So when the charge goes off, it'll push whatever is still in, in the barrel of the gun. Well, unfortunately, they didn't follow protocol or they missed something because when they finally put that charge in the barrel of the gun, the barrel was still too hot, and it exploded immediately, killing two men instantly in the gun mount, and one guy who was just about ready to step into the gun mount, he was thrown and captured in the uh, safety nets, but he later died of his injuries. So we do know that three men died on the ship. Those are the tragic events that we do know that are tied to the ship. But I cannot tell you that it is definitely those three men. Because, again, uh, the military life is, in most cases, a full-time you know, lifestyle for a lot of these men. The, even women today you know, that, that have served our country. And sometimes you find in those situations when, when they pass, sometimes they come back because that's the only life they know. Maybe they didn't have their own, you know, their their families to go home to. Maybe they just stayed, you know, in the military life for the rest of their lives until their time came. So there's a lot of that. And I don't want to assume that it's definitely, you know, that it could be those three men. They may have moved on, you know. So that's the big struggle when, that we have when we, you know, deal with a lot of these stories is you do try to, you know, chip away at the, the story itself and the experiences themselves, because I find that on a lot of this, there is a lot of human error to, to this, because we want to see what we want to see. We want to hear what we want to hear. And so that's where a lot of this assumption comes from, because we've been told these stories, and now when we go and check out this place, we want to believe that that's what we're going to experience. And it does make it very challenging because we don't have that direct communication with the other side. I got to ask you, in regards to investigating in, in any type of haunted location, are there cases you will not take on? I know you pretty much go anywhere and everywhere, but what would what would make you think twice and hold back and say, yeah, I just don't want to do this. I don't feel comfortable. Well, I, to be honest with you, there, you're, you're right. There's a lot of cases that I would do. You know, even if somebody claimed demon, you know, it's, I'd still do it. Um, but I think for me, if there's ever going to be uh, a situation where I wouldn't want to do it, it's because of the living. It's because of the people calling us in, and they just seem to be whack jobs. Because really, it's not the dead you have to be afraid of; it's the living you have to be afraid of. And there's a lot of cases and situations where. You know, I found myself more scared of the people on the property than the ghosts. You know, there was one situation where I was called in as a guest investigator for another team. The team's no longer around, but um, they had asked me to help them out on an investigation that they got called out to. And so I was like, okay, you know, we'll we'll check this out and see what happens. And so you get to this property that's out in the middle of the woods. 
And of course, you know, the guy invites you in and as soon as you all get into the, the, his house, he locks the bolt, locks the door. Okay. You know, this is interesting, but as you look around, you know, you can see what looks like, you know, a machete under the couch. There's blood in this, you know, the bathroom sink, like maybe he majorly cut himself as he was shaving. You know, just a lot of that stuff just made it very uncomfortable for all of us. And so I, I asked him, I said, you know, why did somebody, you know, do a walkthrough? And a walkthrough for my team is a pre-investigation. You know, we try to determine whether these places are worth our time and energy or even, you know, if we're dealing with somebody who's not sane, you know, to, to before we do an investigation. And, and none of that had been done. They just went in blind because, you know, somebody called and said, hey, I've got ghosts. I'm, okay, we'll send up a team right away and investigate. And for me, you know, this is a situation where I said, you know, you guys, we got to get out of here. You know, tell them something came up, you know, whatever. But I didn't feel safe there. And, of course, you know, everybody else that was with me didn't feel safe in that situation. So for me, yeah, that's the kind of case that I would turn down is if I find that the, the living on the property may have mental issues or even uh, a situation where our lives could be a, uh, in danger. We got about six minutes here before we got to go to break at the top of the hour. Ross Allison is our guest tonight. Ross, what about situations that involve children? This, to me, is probably the stickiest. Now, I realize there are some locations you have no control over that, but let's say you went into an area where maybe it was a tuberculosis hospital or, or an orphanage where a lot of children died. Would that affect what you were doing? Like, how do you put the game face on knowing that the innocent of most innocent people were the ones affected mm-hmm. negatively? Well, for me, when you try to pursue this field on a scientific basis, you cannot prejudge the situation regardless of what you've been told. You really have to go with, you know, go with what you know and not with what you think you know. And that has been my biggest thing that I've, I've tried to push out there is, you know, granted, you could, you know, go into an orphanage and you, you you want to believe that in most cases it could be children, but maybe it's not. But in a situation when you are dealing with, you know, sensitive material, and I, I've been in a lot of situations where I've dealt with sensitive material, you, you, you have to be respectful, for one. Um, but the thing is, is I always, you know, go in, with the fact that I'm just trying to focus my attention on the phenomena itself. I'm not trying to label it. I'm not trying to say that, oh, this is definitely the child, the spirit of a child. I'm not trying to say that this is definitely a demon. You know, I'm not trying to say that this is a woman or a man. I'm just trying to focus on the phenomena that people are experiencing, that we are experiencing ourselves, and try to see if we can prove it and try to find out how this all works. So I understand, you know, doing a situation where you're, when you're dealing with children, it is very sensitive. It is very emotional because it is it's sad when you have these young lives that have been taken. But the thing is, is you really do have to focus on the phenomena if you're trying to prove what we are experiencing out there. And there's a lot of people out there, and there's even a lot of theories out there that will say that, you know, most of the times it's, it's not children. It may be something manipulating you to think that it's children. And I know there's a lot of people that have had those experiences. And again, that's where you have to strip it down to the basic phenomena rather than trying to identify it. But there are a lot of situations where I have had to deal with children. And it is, and it is kind of sad. There are situations where I've had to deal with the living children on the property, you know, being harmed. You know, not necessarily children ghosts, but yeah, just children themselves. I had a situation where a woman was abusing her children and tried to blame it on the ghosts. And so, you know, we had to report her in that situation. And that happens happened every there? so often. What happened well, there? it was a situation it was a situation where we could clearly see the abuse. Um, especially when you're going in through the house and you're seeing, you know, holes in the walls and holes in the doors and you ask, Oh, what happened here? And she'll be like, Oh, I punched it. And, but yet she's, you know, showing us pictures of bruises on her children, you know, that look like, you know, handprints. And she's trying to say it's ghosts. 
I'm like, I could clearly see that this woman has a temper, especially when she's punching walls, you know, and, you know, yelling at her kids and cussing about her kids. And it's just like, um, this is not, you know, a healthy situation. And even this, the children's stories, you know, when we interviewed the stories, you know, they, they weren't the same story. They kept changing the story every so often. It was almost like the mother told them the story and told them to tell us that story. Well, that's right. So it's just like, yeah. So it was a situation where we ended up having to report her. So. Yeah, for me, I, I think I would do the, oh, I know I would do the exact same thing, but that's what bothers me is I, I know, I, I got a bit of a quick temper at times, and I just don't know if I could control my temper in something like that. I really do not know. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, it's a situation where, you know, we couldn't make the, the final assessment and say, yes, this is definitely what it was. But obviously, it's not our job to to state that, yes, this is even though we truly believe that that was the situation, that is not what we're here to do. So we obviously had to take it to the people that that is their job to, to assess the situation. And it is hard, you know, because, you know, I, I've, I've been in similar situations where, you know, people have lied about, you know, their house being haunted or their apartment, I should say, being haunted because they wanted to get out of the lease. So you have, you have all kinds of those situations. And so that's where you kind of have to, you know, really be strict on how you do your, you know, your investigation, how you interview these clients. You know, now it's a situation because of the popularity of television shows that people are making up stories just so that they hopefully can be on a television show. I'm still interested in learning about the guy who wanted to break out of his lease and said the place was haunted. Oh, this this is an elderly woman and her grandson were living in an apartment building, and they kept sending us these odd pictures. You know, for me, I should say the pictures that they were sending were too good to be true. And we all know when it's too good to be true, it's most likely not true. All right. I mean, there was a photo and this is, I have to say, how long ago was this? Maybe about 15 years ago, you know, at most, if I can remember correctly. And the thing is, you know, they're sending us photos that were taken with their cell phone and you could see it looks like they captured books you know coming off the shelf as they claimed that you know the shelf was being moved by the being attacked by the ghost hey ross you hold hold on to that story hold on to that story because we're going to go to break here at the top of the hour ross allison going to finish his story on the lease breaker and maybe a couple of his creepiest ghost investigations here on spaced out radio in hour two coming up Hey, Spaced Out Radio fans, it's John Rezig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. Our goal is to make the life of veterans, first responders, and those with rare medical conditions 10% happier. We do this by donating one grant item, ranging from dance to therapy programs to prosthetic limbs, to those who need it most. To contribute to Spaced Out Radio's official charity, head over to chivecharities.org and become a donor today. A little bit of science, a little bit of skepticism. Add a dash of snark and you have the makings of Spaced Out Sundays with me, Everett Thiele. Together we will look into the reality of the paranormal with an open eye and rational thought. Oh, did I mention there'll be plenty of woo as well? Your time spent with Spaced Out Sundays will make the night even better. The chat rooms are open, 9.06 p.m. Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern, right here at spacedoutradio.com. We all know on Spaced Out Radio we love a good beard and mustache, so why not take care of your facial hair with Mighty Moose Beard Oil? Made in Canada, we're taking care of beards and stashes around the world. We use 100% natural ingredients with our oils and balms to make your whiskers feel silky smooth. Use promo code SOR2019 at MightyMooseBeard.com today. For the price of one cup of coffee a month, you can become an SOR space traveler. 
The Space Travelers Club is a place where you can interact with other listeners, either live during the show or on our great forum. We want your stories, pictures, comments, and ideas. You'll get live video streams, exclusive content, and be a part of our newsletter. Stay in touch with everything SOR. The Space Travelers Club is just 5 bucks a month at spacedoutradio.com. The Call of the Wild is in Vancouver. The Moose Vancouver is one of the hottest bars and restaurants in the city. Open until 2 a.m. nightly, the Moose will rock you like a hurricane all night long. Great food with everything on the menu at $6.95. Near the corner of Nelson and Granville, get your horns up and come rock with us. The Moose Vancouver, the official rocking bar of Spaced Out Radio. Hey, this is Canadian Paranormal Investigator Mike Moore. The third Wednesday of every month, I'll be teaming up with Dave Scott to bring you Ghosts of the Great White North. Each month, we will bring on guests from across Canada to discuss their ghostly encounters. Canada is a paranormal hotbed with stories you've never heard, so we're going to bring them to you. So get comfy on your Chesterfield, grab a donut, and join us, eh? Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com. At spacedoutradio.com, we have a little bit of everything for you to stay up late. So while you're there, check out our SOR Newswire, where our team brings you stories of the weird and strange to the WTF from around the globe. News on Bigfoot, UFOs, paranormal, Darwinian-type crime tales. It's the stories that the mainstream media usually won't touch. Well, we got them all on the SOR Newswire, only at spacedoutradio.com. Move over, brother, and let me own Saturday night. This is Rich Giordano, and I'm inviting you to tune on in to Spaced Out Saturday starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, 12 a.m. Eastern, where I'm going to bust open the lids on everything paranormal. Why? Because we want answers, and I'm the guy who's going to deliver those answers to you. Join the chat rooms, and we'll see you this Saturday. Just be there. No, really. Come hang out with Spaced Out Radio, where we own the night. This is Carl. You can follow Dave on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, and during the show, use the hashtag Spaced Out Radio to chat with us live. On Instagram, at Dave Scott S-O-R. On Facebook, give our page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. S-O-R archives are free on YouTube, at Spaced Out Radio. Come join us, or I will come join you. See you at your window. Get your horns up with me on Spaced Out Radio. This is Ron Bumblefoot Thaw. Come tune in to SOR where you can hear me rock out with Little Brother Is Watching, the official theme song of Spaced Out Radio. And then come on over to Bumblefoot.com where you can find out about my tour schedule, my music, and everything else. Bumblefoot.com keeps you up to date on what I'm doing and the best way to stay in touch with my music and music camps. Sign up for my newsletter at Bumblefoot.com and remember, Little Brother Is Watching. Hi. This is Amber Beckrude, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel where we store all of the SOR show archives for free. And as an added bonus, every two weeks, I'm posting brand new content on Cryptid Tales, where I will get into some of the spookier legends and folklore from around the world and tell the stories that go with them. Find us at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio and check out Cryptid Tales today. Drop a comment and let me know what you want to hear. See you there. Are you having encounters with the paranormal, supernatural, or ufological that you cannot explain? Look no further than the SOR Sightlines Report, brought to you by the Experiencer Support Association. This is Ryan Stacy, head of the Research Association, TESSA. Soon on the Spaced Out Radio website, you'll be able to file your reports and have them researched for you. We are independent and ready to help Spaced Out Radio listeners today.
The SOR Vault is open for business, and do we have some cool swag for you to pick up? All you have to do is head over to our website and click on the SOR Vault. You have a variety of cool logos to choose from and put them on anything you want. T-shirts, hoodies, hats, coffee mugs, you name it, we can get it to you. So do your shopping by supporting the store you love. Get your Spaced Out Radio swag at the SOR Vault today. Hi there, this is Geraldina Roscoe from San Francisco's Bay Area Meditation. I invite you to join me the first Tuesday of every month with Dave Scott for Spaced Out Radio's The Spiritual You. In this fast-paced world we live in, it's time for you to take some time for you. We'll cover every possible subject from powerful meditation to healing techniques to your own intuition and spirituality. So come join us for The Spiritual You. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Facebook Spaced Out Radio Show. Welcome back to Hour 2 of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi to everyone listening in on KZFX 93.7 FM in Ridgecrest, California. Chuck, your goatee is looking fantastic. WQEE 99.1 FM in Noonan, Georgia. KDUN AM 1030 in Reedsport, Oregon. UPRN 107.7 FM in New Orleans. And KDNF AM 1560 in Dangerfield, Texas. On the digital side, hi Bardell and Kingdom of Nye radio listeners. Thank you for tuning us in, especially you, Hatterock. And Revolution Radio, Dr. Rowe and the B. People there rocking us out each and every night. Don't forget, you can check out all of our archives for free at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do old Davy the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Red Vivis. Red Vivis is your password. Use it wisely, Space Travelers. As the clam sets a password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website, spacedoutradio.com, has a plethora of features for you. Read up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. It's updated daily. Rock out to Bumblefoot. Sign up for the SOR Space Travelers Club for 5 bucks a month. You can pick up a new book at We Read the Night. And, of course, do a little shopping at the SOR Vault. Ross Allison is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio. He's one of the top paranormal investigators in the United States. I would say North America, if not the world. He is that good. And he's here to tell us some ghost stories tonight. And if you're ever in the Emerald City of Seattle, make sure you check out his haunted tour, as well as his death museum. You definitely want to do that. Ross, welcome back to the show. Oh, that's great. This is awesome. Hey, right before the break, you were telling us a story about one of the cases you covered about a gentleman and his grandmother or mother who were trying to get out of their lease, so they were making up stories that their home was haunted. Yeah, so they were. Um, so it was a grandmother and her grandson, and they were sending us these amazing pictures of things, you know, that they were capturing with their cell phone of things in the middle of the air. And they're claiming that the ghosts are throwing things around and they wanted us to come out and do an investigation. So, you know, we go out there and um, we're checking things out. And the interesting thing is, is like, you know, you, you hear uh, like a, a pounding on the wall. And, of course, we're the type would immediately go to see what kind of make that noise. And you'd see the grandson running out of the room. And he's like, oh, something scared me in the room. So there's a lot of that type of thing going on where it's like, okay, um, you know, why is he always in the room when things tend to happen? And of course it's never when we're there to witness it. So that was happening. But I also found out too, that after we did our initial, you know, this was just our walkthrough. This is where we were interviewing them and then taking control readings and control photos. So we hadn't actually had set up a full investigation. And uh, right after we had done our walkthrough, of course, you know, the building owners, you know, calling me and, you know, trying to figure out what's going on because apparently they're trying to get out of the lease. Well, come to find out, you know, one of the things that I, that I thought was the most interesting part was when they were sending us these, you know, photos that they were capturing with their cell phone. Now, again, this is probably about 15 years ago. Do you remember cell phones 15 years ago? You know, most of those was a flip phone oh, yes. type of stuff. Yes. All right. So I, I did an experiment. I, I, I actually would hold a book up in the in the air, and I had everybody pull out their cell phone, 
And I had them all to please, you know, try and capture the book in the middle of the air as I dropped this book. And I dropped the book probably about, you know, 50, 60 times. And not one person with their cell phone could capture that book in the middle of the air. But yet they were sending us all kinds of photos of things, you know, being thrown at them in the middle of the air with their cell phone. So it was just a lot of that, especially after the, the owner of the building contacting us, wanting to find out what's going on and why they're trying to get out of their lease. It just like proved to me like, yeah, I think that they're just trying to fake things just to get out of their lease. <laughs> That's unbelievable. I don't mean to <laughs> laugh, but, but I mean, you just had to be shaking your head. Has Mike Morin ever told you the story about how his team was called for a paranormal investigation and when they showed up at the residence the people invited a bunch of company over because they thought it would make for a great friday or night entertainment oh yeah i've had that happen too and it's the situation was like well you know there's nothing we can do here there's too many people on the property you know we've had to pack up when they've invited all their friends that's that's pretty common that's actually happened quite a few times and we've had to make it a strict rule before we even set up an investigation. We cannot, you know, make this into a party. You know, we just need so-and-so that have witnessed the experience, the owner of the property there, and that's it. But, yeah, no, I, I've experienced that myself. It's just crazy. It Ross, is. What, is, what is the scariest investigation you've ever been on? Oh, my God, there's... There's been actually a couple now that I talk about, and I, I think I'll, I'll probably show in one of the more recent ones because I know how much we love David Weatherly, and David Weatherly was involved in this one, and, and Dave Spinks. Um, now, this story is, is very interesting. It's a little more long and drawn out, so I apologize, but it, it's amazing what we all experience here. Now, this actually takes place at Bel Air House. Uh, and so this is a very famous place if you look it up. It's been featured on a few shows. Now, um, I'm also a member of SOS, um, Society of the Supernatural, which is David and Dave Spink's uh, group. So they decided they were going to host a conference, their first conference. And so I was invited to be a speaker at the conference. Now, we actually showed up um, like the day before the conference. And so they had put uh, us up at the Bel Air house. Now, David and Dave have their own personal experiences there. So this is, you know, a great place for them. This is the first time I've, I've been there. And to be honest with you, at this point, I was not too familiar with the place. So, I was the first to arrive at the airport. So they had somebody pick me up at the airport and drive me to the house and they dropped me off at the house and they left me alone at the house. Okay. There's no one actually lives in the house anymore. It's, it's operating kind of like as a paranormal bed and breakfast now today. But, uh, I got dropped off at the house and I was there. Now I'm expecting, you know, David and Dave to be coming in. Um, but apparently what happened was Dave was having car trouble he was having problems with his tire. His tire would not hold any air. So he was only able to drive 30 miles before he had had to stop and fill it up again. Now he's traveling a great distance because he's got to go pick up David at the airport. So this ended up being an all night thing for him to try and go get David to bring him back to the house. So I'm alone in this house for a good eight hours by myself. And, you know, I'm fine. I'm walking around the house, no issues whatsoever. This is cool. You know, it's a nice old house. I'm starting to learn a little bit more about the house. So what happens is uh, they finally show up. And um, we basically, the next day, um, Dave has to take his car to the garage. Now, again, the tire's flat overnight so he was actually had a portable pump so he was able to you know pump up the tire so he actually was pumped up the tire he stepped it back into the living room i'm standing in the in the dining room and i happen to look out the window and i see his car slowly backing up and so i yelled to dave you know um uh, dave dave your car your car somebody's stealing his car you know and so he rushes out there, and 
we watch his car slowly go down the hill and slam into a tree. Oh, no. Apparently, yeah. So apparently what, what happened is uh, as the tire was filling up, it causes the car to go into motion. Now, he says his emergency brake was on, so he doesn't know, understand why his car would back into the tree. But that was the, the least damage that that situation could have caused. So lucky for him in that situation. Um, but anyways, you know, so there's a lot of weird stuff that started happening while we're, you know, doing this event. Now, the next day, we're actually going to be going off to another place. You know, we're doing the conference. So, um, so after the conference, now I should point out that during the conference, this place, the Bellar House, was open to all these ghost hunters that stayed the night, you know, throughout the weekend. So we have no idea what was going on, you know, whether there was Ouija board sessions, you know, seances, you know, black magic, whatever. All that crazy stuff could have been happening this whole weekend at that house. But we were at another location. So finally, after the conference, we had an extra day. So we decided to spend that extra day at, back at the Bellar House. Now, at this time... I had learned more about the Bel Air house, the crazy stuff that had taken place there. People, you know, especially women being physically attacked. Um, you know, one guy was almost pushed out, you know, a second story window, you know, just a lot of crazy, you know, very dark, sinister stuff happening in this house. So we're back at the house. Now, the owner of the house, she actually didn't have a chance to open up because she wasn't expecting us to stay another night. We just, we just happened to have the extra time. So she didn't get the air out the house or anything. So when we got to the house, it was literally over 100 degrees inside the house. Now, the guys, you know, they decided they want to do, you know, an investigation that night, which is fine. But they like to do things on their own. So they'll set you up in a room by yourself but they'll put cameras on you so they can, you know, see what's happening. And so the first thing they want to do is they want me to be alone in what they call the rape room. And this is the room where a lot of these women are physically attacked. And it's probably one of the more darker and more active rooms uh, in this you know, house. So I'm standing in this room. They got a camera on me. They, you know, got a thermal camera on me. And I'm going to be honest with you. Out of all the years that I've been investigating in the, in the paranormal, and even David Weatherly can vouch for this, for the first time, I was actually, I, I don't want to say afraid, but there was something bothering me about being alone in this room. And it was, it was actually making me mad because, you know, I, I've investigated, you know, close to 30 years now, and I've never had this feeling before. And I was getting mad at myself for having this feeling, this, this I don't want to be alone in this room feeling, you know? And I, I was kind of getting mad at the guys, like, God, I wish they didn't, you know, have me do this or, you know, just a lot of that. But all, all these emotions were going through me, and, and I, I just, I didn't understand it. And so I'm trying, you know, to, you know, you know, tough it up and say, I can do this. You know, this is no different than all the other places I've investigated. And so I, you know, I'm trying to be respectful too, you know, so I'm, you know, just calling out questions, you know, if there's anybody here, can you give me a sign? And I'm probably in the room for a good, you know, 10, um, 15 minutes, you know, and after hearing all the stories that have happened in this room, for me, when my team investigates, I always, you know, safety first. So I don't ever let my team investigate by themselves. They always got to have a partner with them. And I started getting concerned because I'm standing right next to the second story window. And I know about the story about the guy who was almost pushed out the second story window. So I just want to make sure, you know, that if anything's going to happen, these guys got my back. So, so, and I kind of got a little ahead of myself here. So one of the things is, is I'm sitting there, you know, I'm talking out loud to whatever's in the room. And I said, if there's somebody here that can give me a sign, you know, please give me a sign. And right after I had asked that, all of a sudden the thermal camera flies off the tripod into the air and crashes on the ground. 
Oh, no. I screamed. It's on video. <laughs> so, and they heard me. So they, you know, come rushing up the stairs, you know, making sure I'm okay. And it's just like, you know, the thermal camera went off, you know, the tripod, so they fixed it, you know, and then they left me alone again in the room. So at this point, you know, after seeing the physical phenomena of a you know, camera flying off the tripod, I was a little more concerned for my safety. And so I, and I heard when they went back downstairs, I heard them probably go outside. So I was a little more concerned about my safety. So I started yelling for them because I want to make sure if something else was going to happen, they got my back. So I start yelling for the guys, no response. And I'm yelling and yelling and, and no one's responding. You know, and so finally I pull out my cell phone because I figure they're probably outside. They can't hear me. So I pull out my cell phone. I text them, and, I, and all of a sudden, right after I text them, I hear David from downstairs going, are you okay? And so finally he comes upstairs and is like, I've been yelling for you guys. Why isn't? Why can't you guys hear me downstairs? It's like, we're not hearing anything. And I'm just the room directly above them, you know, and they couldn't hear me yelling for them no yelling their names. Yeah. So I was a little you know, concerned about this. I, I, I asked David, I said, I just want to make sure that if anything happens to me, that you guys got my back, but I'm a little more concerned with the fact that they couldn't even hear me screaming for them, you know? So David says, yeah, we're just downstairs. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll be right here if you need us. So David walks, you know, turns around and walks, starts to walk back out down the hallway, down the stairs. And as he's, you know, heading down the stairs, we hear this loud bang, you know, upstairs in the hallway. And I yell out to the hallway, out to David, and I can hear Dave yell from downstairs up to David, you know, what was that? And David's like, what was what? And like, we both heard this loud bang and he, David was the only one that didn't hear it. So that was interesting. So I'm, you know, and again, this room is over a hundred degrees. I'm sweating bullets here. And I still have that feeling, especially after being startled with the camera of this. I don't want to be in this room, especially alone. So I finally said, you know what, you guys, I got to take a break. So I go um, outside and I'm standing in the driveway around that, you know, around from the, the front porch and, you know, I just needed to cool off. I decided, you know, since I'm standing outside, I'm going to do a 15 minute, you know, like little, you know, live feed from Facebook and I'm just standing there cooling off and stuff. And I, and I know Dave, he went upstairs into the room to do his little session in the room. Now Dave is already ticked off because he believes that whatever is in the house has caused all this problem with his car. So he goes in the room and he starts cussing out, you know, out whatever's in the room, you know, like, you know, why are you messing with my car? That kind of stuff. And I can hear him cause I'm just, you know, on the first floor on the, in the driveway, just outside that window. And I can hear him yelling and screaming at that whatever's in that room. And I'm literally out there for maybe on 10, 15 minutes and I'm still doing the live feed. And, um, I, he had he already finished his session, so it was kind of quiet for a while. And then uh, I see David come around the porch, and he looks at me, and he says, oh, there you are. And I said, yeah, here I am, you know. And he's like, Dave's been looking for you. He's been yelling throughout the house trying to find you. And I was like, I've been standing here the whole time. I didn't hear a, a thing. And everybody you know, on the live feed are like, yeah, we didn't hear anything either. And so, of course, you know, Dave comes running around the, the corner out on the porch, and he's like, where the hell have you been? And I'm like, I've been standing here the whole time. He's like, I've been yelling throughout the house for you, worried about you. I even stepped out on the front porch was yelling for you. And I couldn't hear a damn thing. How far was the porch from yeah. where you were? Oh, good, maybe 50 feet. That's it? That's That's nothing. It. You should have heard I him know. yelling. I know. I should have heard him yelling throughout the house. So then 
we decide, okay, uh, we're going to do another session of ghost hunting. So we all, you know, get back into the, the house and we're standing downstairs and all of a sudden we hear this loud noise upstairs again. The same noise that we heard when Dave, when David was in the, what we thought was in the hallway, thought he had made the noise. So David decides he's going to go and investigate. And I was actually going to trail up behind him, but I, I didn't have my stuff ready to go up behind him. So David goes up ahead of us and all of a sudden we hear him scream. And so of course, you know, I go rushing up, Dave's right behind me and we're like, what happened? And he says that while he was walking down the hallway to see what made that noise, he saw from one of the rooms, somebody coming rushing at him. And that caused him to, to, to yell. What made it worse is he said it looked exactly like me. No. Yeah. And the interesting thing was, he, it was rushing him from the room I was staying in. No way. So, yeah, so after he explains that, all of a sudden, Dave screams from behind me because he sees something rushing at him from, a, from another room. It was about at that point, I had had enough. <laughs> I needed a break. So I went back outside, and that was probably one of the most interesting, bizarre investigations I had ever done. No kidding. Yeah. We, we only got about a minute and 10 seconds before we got to go to break. I want to get Tripp's question in here. And he's asking, when the tripod fell... Did the video stop or did it keep recording? So it wasn't the tripod that fell. The tripod was still standing there. Literally, the camera shot off the tripod up into the air and then fell down to the ground. And it recorded the whole time. So we do have video of that happening. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's getting a little too real. A little too well, real. The, the weirdest part is that whole manipulation of sound. Yeah, no kidding. It's like, you know, people are running around the house yelling and no one could hear it. So that was the weirdest thing for me. That's the first time I've ever experienced that. Where you could literally be yelling for people and no one would hear you on the first floor. Just one floor down. That's amazing. That is just amazing. Ross, you hold on. We're going to go to break here at the bottom of the hour. Ross Allison is our guest tonight, sharing some of his spookiest stories from around North America as we are a week away from Halloween night. We'll get to your questions. We'll get to more stories from Ross coming up on Space Out Radio right after this. Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. SpacedOutRadio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages to play on the radio or our website, including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. Every night on Space Out Radio, we have places for you to hang out. Hi, this is Carl. Join our SOR Space Travelers group on Facebook for live chat. On Twitter, using hashtag Spaced Out Radio, you can also join us in our Spreaker chat room. Check us out on Instagram at Dave Scott SOR. All of our archives are free on YouTube at Spaced Out Radio. By the way, I'll be watching you at your window until you do. Bye! Finish off your weekend and kick off your new week with me, Everett Themer, right here on Spaced Out Sundays. I'm going to bring you great guests, a little bit of snark, and plenty of information to think about. But don't worry, there's going to be plenty of woo as well. We are going to hit everything in the paranormal and supernatural, including the odd psychic Sundays. 
So tune us in on Sunday, 9.06 p.m. Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern, right here at spacedoutradio.com. You wanted new SOR gear, and now you can have it. The SOR Vault is fully stocked with t-shirts, hats, hoodies, mugs, and everything in between with great logos for you to choose from. So head on over to spacedoutradio.com, click on the SOR Vault, and go shopping. Pricing is quite affordable, and you can look good representing your favorite show. So go to our website and pick up your new SOR wear at the SOR Vault today. Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. Hey everybody, the SOR Space Travelers is open. For just five bucks a month, you can hang out with Dave and our crew privately in our members-only section. With your signing, you'll receive newsletters on what's going on with Spaced Out Radio. You'll have direct contact with the host during the show in our chat, live streaming videos, and a great forum for your posts and more. Become a space traveler now at spacedoutradio.com. From the heartlands of Canada to beards around the world, we know how to take care of you. Fill your follicles with the Mighty Moose Beard Oil. All our oils and balms are handmade and 100% natural ingredients because we care about your beard. And hey, use the promo code SOR2019 and get your Mighty Moose Beard Oil today. You can check us out on our website, MightyMooseBeard.com. Heading to Vancouver and looking for a night on the town? The Moose Vancouver is the bar that never stops rocking until 2 a.m. every night. The Moose has great food with everything on the menu from $6.95 to $8.95. Fantastic, vibrant staff and rock and roll that will bring you back to when the music was real, the hair was long, and the guitars were rocking. Get your party on at the Moose Vancouver, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. Hey, space travelers, this is John Resig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. If you know anything about our website, you know we like to do things a little differently. We're not some faceless organization collecting money for a nebulous cause. Our donor dollars go directly toward life-improving items. Then we give those items directly to an underdog who needs it most. To become a donor with Spaced Out Radio's official charity, Chive Charities, just go to chivecharities.org forward slash donate. We're adding to the entertainment online for Spaced Out Radio. I'm Amber Beckard, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out Cryptid Tales, where I will take you on a journey into some of the strangest legends and lore from around the world, relaying the stories to you of the strange creatures and experiences that people have had throughout time. You can find Cryptid Tales at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our free archives and leave a comment. See you there. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com. Coming soon to our website, spacedoutradio.com, is the SOR Space Travelers Club. For just five bucks a month, you can get into a private area on our site where you can hang with other listeners in our chat room, post in our forum, and check out a bunch of exclusive content and store that won't be found anywhere else, including a nightly after show party with Dave. It's going to be the best $5 a month you're going to spend. The SOR Space Travelers, only at spacedoutradio.com. Move over, brother, and let me own Saturday night. This is Rich Giordano, and I'm inviting you to tune on in to Spaced Out Saturday starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, 12 a.m. Eastern, where I'm going to bust open the lids on everything paranormal. Why? 
because we want answers and I'm the guy who's going to deliver those answers to you. Join the chat rooms and we'll see you this Saturday. Just be there. No, really. We pass the halfway point of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. Great to have you with us. want to remind all of you, if you've missed portions of this show or others, you can always go to our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you. You can do a little shopping at the SOR Vault. Pick up a new book on We Read the Night. Join the SOR Space Travelers Club for five bucks a month or capture some good stories in the news from the SOR Newswire put together by Captain Shirk. I want to give a shout out to Gene in D.C. Hi, Gene in D.C. Been a while. Give me a call sometime. Thank you so much for listening on in. Ross Allison is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio. He's one of the premier paranormal investigators in the United States, based out of Seattle, Washington. But right now he's doing his annual tour on the East Coast, speaking at universities and all over the place about Haunted 101. What's it like to go chasing ghosts for a living? Ross, welcome back. And it's always a pleasure. Doing this tour that you do for the last 16 years, where you go lecture all across the East Coast of the United States, what's the freakiest? Um, what's the freakiest thing that has happened while on this tour? Oh, it's another one of my famous stories that I get to tell. Um, so, as I was saying, I, I lecture at colleges, so I do like an hour lecture on what it's like to be a ghost hunter. And then, of course, afterwards, I most of the time get the pleasure of doing a ghost hunt on the campus. So I get invited to a lot of these, you know, very well-known haunted campuses all over the U.S. Now, I was invited to St. Louis University. Now, for a lot of people, most people aren't aware that St. Louis University is actually very famous for the entity case, or not the entity, the exorcist case, sorry. So that is the one uh, that starred the, uh, Linda Blair, you know, the exorcist. So I was invited out to this campus. And I do, you know, my hour lecture. And, of course, afterwards, they're setting me up on an investigation. Now, the investigation was at this building that was right next to the church that was involved in the exorcist case. Now, this building at one time was owned by the church but they have now sold the building to the campus itself. So we go around, you know, through all the different floors, and it, you know, it's just a nice old building. But to my surprise, when they took me to the fourth floor, I was surprised to find that it was completely run down. I mean, graffiti everywhere, holes in the walls. It was just uh, surprising to me, especially after I've been through, you know, the first three floors. Well, Come to find out that uh, they've had so many problems on the fourth floor that they've decided to just abandon it. And when they say problems, you know, they're referring to paranormal problems. So I'm a little more intrigued, and they're they're going around taking me through the different rooms. Now, at one point, the nuns used to live on the fourth floor, so I can see all the tiny little rooms that they used to live in. There's also classrooms up there because that's where the nuns used to teach Sunday school. So there's a lot of interesting history here. And we continue on, you know, through the rest of the rooms. And I finally walk into this one room. And right when I walked in the room, I heard this crunch underneath my feet. And I looked down and I realized I had stepped on a dead bird. Now, that was nothing unusual for me because I've been a lot of abandoned places. and Animals, you know, get trapped and they die. So it was really no big deal for me. So I just kind of kicked the bird over the side so no one else would step on the bird. But then when I shined my flashlight through the rest of the room, I was surprised to find that the room was just filled with dozens and dozens of dead birds. Now, what makes this interesting is the fact that security had removed all the doors on the fourth floor. 
And the reason for this is because they've had too many problems with students sneaking up there and scaring each other. So it just made it easier for them to do their you know, rounds if they didn't have to open and close doors. So I realized that, wow, um, these birds had access to the whole fourth floor. Why did they all choose to you know, die in this one room? Well, come to find out, this is the room that the boy had stayed in. Now, if you're not familiar with the Exorcist case, the story is that a young boy was brought to the campus and they felt that they could not perform a full exorcism on the boy inside the church because this could possibly kill the boy. So they moved him to various secret locations and they performed multiple exorcisms on this boy before they finally finished at the local hospital. Now, I realize that I am now standing in this room where the boy had stayed for a short time, knowing now that an exorcism had been performed in this room. Okay. Creep factor's just gone up a bit. Yes. Now, I have a a small group of students with me that actually have some of the basic equipment that I've, you know, given them for the investigation. So we get into this room and we're in this room for less than five minutes when all of a sudden all the equipment starts to go off at the exact same time. We're talking, the temperature starts to drop in the room and we can feel the room getting colder and colder, almost to the point where I'm expected to see my breath anytime soon. The EMF detector is going off like crazy and we can't figure out what's causing these EMF readings. The compass is spinning around and around and around, and it will not stop. So I realized, oh, my God, this is really happening. So I, I got to prove this. I got to document this. So luckily for me, my camera shoots an infrared video. So I switch my camera over to video. I start filming everything that's going on in the room. I'm filming the students. I'm filming the equipment going off. And it starts to slow down a little bit. So I realize, okay, before it completely stops, I want to try for some EVP. So I start to ask questions into the air. And I got to the question that I had asked, can you tell me whose room this is? Now, it was about 12 seconds of silence. And then I start to hear crying to the left of me. And I turn and I realize that a couple of the female students have started to cry because they're so terrified being in this room. Now, I have to admit, I'm a little uncomfortable too. So I decide, you know what, um, let's wrap it up. Uh, Because again, I don't know what we're up against. So for me, it's always safety first. So I decide, you know, let's go on and we'll move on to another location to continue our investigation. Well, I was hoping that later I'd have the opportunity to go back and continue my investigation, but I didn't get that opportunity. But when I finally finished my lecture tour and I got home and started reviewing all the evidence that I collected at all these campuses, I actually got to that video. And I got to the part in the video where it asked, can you tell me whose room this is? I got two responses. Now, I'll edit this because I don't want to offend anybody, but it's nothing different than you wouldn't hear in an R-rated movie. But basically it says, F you, it's mine. No way. Yeah. That is probably one of the most creepiest places I've ever investigated during my lecture tour. No kidding. Yeah. Would you go, I would be itching to go back. Oh, and I actually got the opportunity to go back. And that's where it even gets weirder. All right, so fast forward a little bit. Um, Eight years later, I finally got called back to do another lecture at the campus. Now, during this time, they had actually renovated the fourth floor. So when I was talking to the students um, that were asking me to come out, I was trying to, you know, recall the room, where that room was, because I definitely wanted to go back to that room. And so they were trying to figure out, you know, with the new floor plans, you know, where that, where that space would have been after the renovation. And, uh, you know, we're, you know, talking back and forth, back and forth. And 
come to find out, this is where it gets interesting. They renovated the whole fourth floor, but that room. They oh, basically man. have that whole room on its own sealed off from the rest because of all the issues with that room. So this makes it more interesting. Now, throughout the years, security have tried to use that room for storage. They would put their bikes up in that room and then come back and find that the chains have been ripped off the bike. The seat would be bent around. The handlebars would be bent around. So they couldn't leave anything in that room anymore. So they've just basically have left that room all alone by itself. So once I found this out, I was like, oh, my God, this is exciting. We now can go back, you know, and investigate that one room. And they were all for it, you know. They got the permission for me to go back up into that room and everything. Now, here's where it's interesting. The only way to get to that room now is you have to take this old staircase. And it's a, an old staircase that you could actually hear somebody going up and down the staircase. You cannot sneak up and down that staircase. It makes a lot of noise. So I was granted permission to go ahead and set up equipment overnight in the room, and I'd be able to come back and pick it up in the morning. So this is great. So we go up, you know, that old staircase. We get back to that room. It's the same as I exactly remember it. I set up some audio equipment. And what happens is the next day when I come back to get my equipment, it's all there. But when I went and played back the recording, this is where it gets more interesting. Throughout that night, you can hear in the recording, you hear us, you know, walking up the stairs because I had the recorder going when we got to that staircase. So you hear us walking up the stairs. You hear me set up all the equipment. And then you can hear us leave down that old staircase. But throughout the night, you can actually hear on that recording somebody walking around up there. You can actually hear at one point what sounds like a train coming into the depot. And as it's coming into the depot, you can hear what sounds like a woman pounding on a door screaming, let me out, let me out. Uh -uh. No way. And I couldn't explain any of this. I'm just like, why am I hearing a train? And so I had forwarded all these weird things. You know, somebody walking up there, something pounding on the walls. You know, I had forwarded all that to, you know, the students that were in charge of having me out there. And I was asking them, can you help me explain this? Why am I hearing a train? And they're like, there's, there's no train anywhere nearby. They couldn't even explain it. But during that whole, you know, thing, you hear that pounding of a woman screaming, let me out, let me out. It was just all the weird sounds that I was picking up on that, on that recorder. It was just it was amazing. And I, I'd love to go back. I don't blame you. I don't blame yeah. you. Wow. I don't even know what to say about that because, I mean, that's just that's just creepy, man. That's just creepy. It is. It is. Well, let me ask you this. As we got about eight and a half minutes, nine minutes before we got to go to break. Ross Allison is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio talking haunted stories here. Ross, when you get into a situation like that where where you have – so much activity happening, and it is just the weird factor times 10. How much do you rely on your own props? How much do you change your game plan to try and, to try and manipulate the situation to your advantage so that way you're able to get something different than other people? Well, you know, a lot of things, yeah, one of the things I should say you have to really understand is with ghost hunting, it's all about being in the right time, right place at the right time. So you don't always get those experiences where amazing things are happening at all, especially all at once. So for me, it's always a been trying to capture everything as much as you can on your devices, you know, on video, on audio to help support that experience. And you don't always get that opportunity it seems like for me, the, the most interesting thing is, is that they like to tease us. They like to know that you're not prepared for them. And that's when, you know, things tend to happen. 
that you'll tend to have, you know, the craziest experiences and you don't always get to record it. And that's so frustrating because I've always, you know, I've trained my team to always be prepared. And sometimes these things happen so quick, you're not even sure what you just experienced. And you're hoping that something was recording it to capture at the time. But a lot of times, and this is one of the biggest things I'm really trying to push for um, investigating the paranormal, is uh, 360 recording. You know, we should never have these missed opportunities anymore where something happens in the corner of your eye or the camera is facing the wrong way and something happens behind you and you always tend to miss it. If we're recording in 360, which is available, unfortunately not all in infrared, um, but if we had that available to us more often, we would be able to capture a lot of this phenomena and not always miss it. So for me, when having those experiences, which again, that don't always happen all the time, um, it's all about trying to capture as much of that phenomenon as possible. Because unfortunately, if I don't capture it, then it just becomes my story. And hopefully those who are listening to my story will believe me. But you lose, you don't ever want to lose that credibility if you don't, you know, unfortunately have the opportunity to capture that phenomenon to support your experience. It really is a difficult balance. And, you know, they're even saying that in the cryptid world where a lot of guys are trying to advance it more because what they're noticing in the cryptid world, and I'm sure David would would uh, say this, David Weatherly, that is, is that too many times a lot of these experiences are happening when the the people already whether you when you walk down the trail and all of a sudden behind you is where these creatures are peering out whether it's dog man or whether it's bigfoot or or whomever and th- that can be a little frustrating it is it really is because you know again like i said you've had this incredible experience and 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 and, and it's a situation too where you're not second guessing yourself either you know you had this experience but you didn't get it recorded in any way. So now it's just your story. And, that, and it is really frustrating. I can see that. I can, I can hear it in your voice. I can totally hear it in your voice. <laughs> that you're just like, damn it, we've got to do this. We've got to do that. Because you know, it, it happens, you know, and it's just like, oh, my God. So, yeah, yeah. Oh, it is frustrating. Man. I could just imagine, just imagine, Ross Allison, our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio. we got about five minutes here before we got to go to break. In regards to a situation like that where you come across something which is potentially that demonic, how does a demonic case change, Ross, from your, from your everyday haunting? Let's say you go to someone's house to clear out a spirit because, you know, the mother is getting a little frustrated that, you know, somebody keeps folding her laundry in the middle of the day while she's out at work and all the doors and windows are locked comparatively to a situation like this where you're potentially dealing with demons. Well, for me, and again, um, trying to be respectful here because I don't try to use the term demonic when it comes to labeling things um, in my perspective in the paranormal field. Because if you really are truly trying to be scientific in your research, you can't use labels like demon, because demon is a religious aspect of the paranormal field. Um, it's, it, it's one of those things where you cannot be led by a religious perspective. Now, don't get me wrong. I do believe that there are entities out there that can be evil in most cases or very negative in most cases. So, you know, for me, that becomes a challenge, especially when you're dealing with a situation where it is causing harm to the people on the property. And there is only so much you can do. You know, if if somebody wants to say, yeah, it's demonic, then it all becomes down to, it comes down to the fact that you kind of have to, you know, focus on the religious aspect of it. But for me, I try not to go down that road. I, I really try to, to focus on the phenomena itself. But 
like I said, you know, there are some very negative energies out there, but there, I, I find for me, they tend to be a little more, um, not as often as you will come across more positive or neutral, you know, phenomena. But when it comes to something that I feel is causing harm to those on the property, I will definitely do whatever I can to help in that situation. You know, whether it's maybe a spirit that's just confused and they're mad because somebody's on the property. And again, it all comes down to the fact is how much communication can you have with the other side? And, you know, it could be a situation where it's just not aware that it's passed on. Or it could be just a situation where, you know, somebody has decided they just want to be a dick, you know, on the other side. You know, I think about it myself. If I, if I would, and there's a demon in your house. You know? <laughs> Why not? Why not? Well, we've seen it at the bar. We, we've seen it at the, at the museum where we are, too. I mean, you being there, that that uh, gentleman there up on the on the ramp there, he... He has an attitude. He doesn't like to be bugged. He doesn't like to be pestered. He doesn't like his photo taken, you know, and you got to deal with it. You you just have to right. be able to solve the solution. Instead of going around yelling demons like some people do, what you need to do is but solve see, the problem. Right, and that's the problem we have now is because of these television shows, they want to label everything a demon. They want to push the fear factor on people. In most cases, what scares us the most is that you're, you're unsure of what's going on. You watch these scary shows. You watch you know, these television shows. And they say, oh, it's a demon, and everybody runs with it. You know, the, even if the fact that, you know, oh, they, they might have heard a growl in the room. They immediately hit the panic button and say, oh, it was a demon because I heard a growl. Or they mm -hmm. saw a dark, shadowy figure moving in their room. They immediately hit that panic button and say, oh, it's a demon. I don't think that, you know, if you're seeing a dark shadow or a dark figure, that it is a demon. I think it's just another form of apparition in most cases when people see those. But again, uh, it, we're taught that because of all these television shows, that it, it's got to be a demon. There's a lot of, of misinformation on a lot of these shows. I, I see a lot of things being misrepresented, um, a lot of uh, wrong information being used. But then we also have a, a situation where even some of the devices are being misused or even right. being uh, used in a suggestive way to mislead people because these shows rely on fear. They rely on the fact that the, these ghost hunters are going to go screaming into the night because they're terrified of what they experience. And that pisses me off the most. When well, I see these people you. claiming to be, oh, I'm a professional ghost hunter, and then as soon as they, they experience a bump in the night, they go screaming and run away. I'm like, What? You know? That's what you live for. That's what you live for. Rossi, <laughs> hold on. We're going to go to break at the top of the hour. Two quick hours down. We got Ross Allenson for another 30 minutes in hour three. Then we get to the SOR Newswire and the thought of the day. Stay tuned. Spaced Out Radio continues after this. Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. Coming soon to our website, spacedoutradio.com, is the SOR Space Travelers Club. For just five bucks a month, you can get into a private area on our site where you can hang with other listeners in our chat room, post in our forum, and check out a bunch of exclusive content and store that won't be found anywhere else, including a nightly after show party with Dave. It's going to be the best $5 a month you're going to spend. The SOR Space Travelers, only at spacedoutradio.com. 
we're adding to the entertainment online for Spaced Out Radio. I'm Amber Beckard, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out Cryptid Tales, where I will take you on a journey into some of the strangest legends and lore from around the world, relaying the stories to you of the strange creatures and experiences that people have had throughout time. You can find Cryptid Tales at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our free archives and leave a comment. See you there. We all know on Spaced Out Radio, we love a good beard and mustache. So why not take care of your facial hair with Mighty Moose Beard Oil? Made in Canada, we're taking care of beards and stashes around the world. We use 100% natural ingredients with our oils and balms to make your whiskers feel silky smooth. Use promo code SOR2019 at MightyMooseBeard.com today. Every night on Space Out Radio, we have places for you to hang out. Hi, this is Carl. Join our SOR Space Travelers group on Facebook for live chat. On Twitter, using hashtag Spaced Out Radio, you can also join us in our Spreaker chat room. Check us out on Instagram at Dave Scott SOR. All of our archives are free on YouTube at Spaced Out Radio. By the way, I'll be watching you at your window until you do. Bye! For the price of one cup of coffee a month, you can become an SOR Space Traveler. The Space Travelers Club is a place where you can interact with other listeners, either live during the show or on our great forum. We want your stories, pictures, comments, and ideas. You'll get live video streams, exclusive content, and be a part of our newsletter. Stay in touch with everything SOR. The Space Travelers Club is just 5 bucks a month at spacedoutradio.com. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com. Hey, space travelers, this is John Rezig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. If you know anything about our website, you know we like to do things a little differently. We're not some faceless organization collecting money for a nebulous cause. Our donor dollars go directly toward life-improving items. Then we give those items directly to an underdog who needs it most. To become a donor with Spaced Out Radio's official charity, Chive Charities, just go to chivecharities.org forward slash donate. A little bit of science, a little bit of skepticism. Add a dash of snark and you have the makings of Spaced Out Sundays with me, Everett Thiele. Together we will look into the reality of the paranormal with an open eye and rational thought. Oh, did I mention there'll be plenty of woo as well? Your time spent with Spaced Out Sundays will make the night even better. The chat rooms are open, 9.06 p.m. Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern, right here at spacedoutradio.com. Heading to Vancouver and looking for a night on the town? The Moose Vancouver is the bar that never stops rocking until 2 a.m. every night. The Moose has great food with everything on the menu from $6.95 to $8.95. Fantastic, vibrant staff and rock and roll that will bring you back to when the music was real, the hair was long, and the guitars were rocking. Get your party on at the Moose Vancouver, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. At SpacedOutRadio.com, we have a little bit of everything for you to stay up late. So while you're there, check out our SOR Newswire, where our team brings you stories of the weird and strange to the WTF from around the globe. News on Bigfoot, UFOs, paranormal, Darwinian-type crime tales. It's the stories that the mainstream media usually won't touch. Well, we got them all on the SOR Newswire, only at SpacedOutRadio.com. Move over, brother, and let me own Saturday night. This is Rich Giordano, and I'm inviting you to tune on in to Spaced Out Saturday starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, 12 a.m. Eastern, where I'm going to bust open the lids on everything paranormal. Why? Because we want answers, and I'm the guy who's going to deliver those answers to you. Join the chat rooms, and we'll see you this Saturday. Just be there. No, really. 
The SOR Vault is open for business, and do we have some cool swag for you to pick up. All you have to do is head over to our website and click on the SOR Vault. You have a variety of cool logos to choose from, and put them on anything you want. T-shirts, hoodies, hats, coffee mugs, you name it, we can get it to you. So do your shopping by supporting the store you love. Get your Spaced Out Radio swag at the SOR Vault today. A timepiece is a reflection of who you are. And what better way to show off the real you than with an Escape watch? Escape is a lifestyle brand accessorizing your days and nights. Choose to escape and create the life of discovery that you deserve. Dream, play, unite with your own personalized Escape watch. Head to escapewatches.com. There is no time like the present to enjoy your escape. Use promo code SMF2017 for your 20% discount today. Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. SpacedOutRadio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages to play on the radio or our website including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. you like to connect with us head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info now back to dave scott and sor we're underway in the third and final hour of spaced out radio tonight i am your host dave scott thank you so much for being with us we want to welcome back everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates, KDNF AM 1560 in Dangerfield, Texas, UPRN 107.7 FM in New Orleans, KZFX 93.7 FM in Ridgecrest, California, KDUN AM 1030 in Reedsport, Oregon, and we're on in Newton, Georgia, home of the Walking Dead, WQEE 99.1 FM. On the digital side, hi to everyone listening in on Revolution Radio and Kingdom of Nye Radio. Appreciate you tuning us in. Don't forget, you can check out all of our archives for free at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Ready, Ready Vivis. I don't know what this means. Ready Vivis. But the clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot. Do a little shopping at the SOR Vault, because you need a Spaced Out Radio shirt or hoodie, whatever it may be, or a pillow. Get a pillow. They're comfortable. And, of course, we have the SOR Newswire by Captain Shirk. Sign up for the SOR Space Travelers Club, 5 bucks a month. And if you want a good book... Go to We Read the Night. Ross Allison is here a week before Halloween sharing some of his freakiest stories that he has encountered over his 20-plus years of investigating the paranormal. He's based out of Seattle, Washington, one of the premier paranormal investigators in North America, in my opinion, and I like to say that because I think he is. And you got to go down to oh, Seattle. Oh, thank you. Check. You're welcome. You're so welcome, bud. You, you got to go down to Seattle if you're in the Washington State area and check out the Death Museum because there is a weird factor times 10 in there, including one mysterious haunted doll. Ross, I know a few listeners always ask me about Mr. Creepy. Oh, Mr. Creepy, yes. Uh, one of my favorite, favorite characters over at Spooked in Seattle. Now, he is actually, if you're not familiar with him, he's a ventriloquist doll. Um, he was made in the 1960s by a retired ventriloquist artist. And what's interesting about this doll is he was actually made in the ventriloquist artist a likeness. Yeah, he actually made a female counterpart in his wife's likeness. Now, what makes these dolls a little more creepy is the fact that they actually use their real hair on the dolls. So that's uh, interesting alone. Now, story has it that the, uh, the owner of the doll, uh, he and his wife had actually perished in an accident. And after their death, the dolls were sold as a pair at the estate sale. Now, this woman who actually deals with antiques, 
she purchased the dolls and she put them on a shelf behind her register at her store. Now they sat there for a good long time, no issues whatsoever. But unfortunately, they sold her store, the building. So this meant that she actually had to pack up and move her store. So she packed up the dolls separately and she put them into storage. And then once she got her new location, she'd go back to the storage unit and pull pieces to restock her store. Well, when she went to the storage unit, she found Mr. Creepy, but she didn't find the female counterpart. But she went ahead and took him and she put him in a glass case behind the register. Now, this is where things get interesting. Right away, she started having these weird experiences. She would actually feel like there's somebody standing behind her, breathing down the back of her neck. She always feels like she's being watched. This constantly gave her the chills. Now, she also would experience when she'd come into the shop that uh, his head would be turned in another direction. His eyes would be looking in another direction. Now, what's really odd about that is his eyes are actually spring-loaded. So what that means is when you're playing around with the trigger to move his eyes left or right, once you let go of the trigger, his eyes automatically spring back to the center. They cannot stay left or right unless you're holding on to that trigger. But there are days when she would come in and she would actually see him looking left or right. In fact, when we've had him at Spooked in Seattle, I've experienced that myself. Now, being the paranormal investigator I am, I'm intrigued to find out what's going on. So anytime, anytime I try to open the case to see what's going on, any vibration that I cause, it automatically causes his eyes to spring right back to the center. It's startling. But she was experiencing that. She said someday she'd come in and find that the glass case would be wide open. After having these experiences time and time again, she had enough. She decided to move him to the back of the store and put him on a bottom shelf. So she didn't have to see him every day. Well, I go to a lot of these antique stores looking for pieces for my museum. And I always tend to ask these, you know, owners of these antique stores, do you have anything that's odd? Because I like to hear their stories and what they think is odd. And immediately she introduced me to him. And I just fell in love with this guy. I thought, you know, yes, he would be perfect at my museum. So she was so happy to get rid of him that she sold me him for $1. Now, I take him to Spoot, and I put him in this antique glass case. And one day, I'm actually alone in the store, and I hear this thud against glass. Now, immediately, I thought something happened in the gift shop. So I go out, and I start exploring, you know, all over the gift shop. I can't find anything disturbed. And I'm looking all over the place, and I'm trying to figure out what made that noise. And I'm kind of walking around, and as I come around the tables, I'm now facing that glass case. And I realize that his head is now turned and up against the glass. So being the paranormal investigator, I am, I quickly pull out my phone, and I take a picture just to prove that this really happened. Well, what's interesting is in this photo, and I believe you can find it online too, is in the photo, you can actually see in the reflection of Mr. Creepy, the face is completely different. Now, if you ever see a, a, a photo of Mr. Creepy, you can see he's got very cartoonish features. He's big, round eyes, he's big, round cheeks, a big, round face. But when you look at the reflection in this photo, his eyes are very droopy. His face is more elongated, more lifelike looking. And I think that is the spirit of the man that haunts this doll. Now, a lot of people, you know, ask me why, you know, why is he, you know, doing a lot of this? And I think he's looking for the female counterpart. They haven't been separated since the day they were created. So I am on a quest to try and bring those two together. So I have been known to post articles out there, Mr. Creepy looking for Mrs. Creepy. Hmm. 
<laughs> that doll just, I've never seen it. I've seen photos of it. And the fact that it has human hair is a little twisted right well, off the bat. Oh, it is. It is. I mean, let's just be honest there. That, that is just full of creepiness right there. No pun intended. But in regards to the hunt for Mrs. Creepy, what do you think happened to her? Because if the doll is haunted or if the do- doll is sad, so to speak, which mm-hmm. many many people would be considering, you know, loss of spouse, do you right. believe do you believe Mrs. Creepy is still out there? Oh, yeah. Now, here's the situation. Um, I I do think I know where she is. The woman that owns the antique store, she is a bit of a hoarder. So it's not just one storage unit she has. She has multiple storage units out there. And they're all jam-packed with all these antiques, you know, that she's, you know, planning on selling. So I have actually, I've gone to her a number of times. You know, hey, would you allow me to go through and see if I can try and find her? Or would you allow me to bring my team out to see if we can actually try and find her? And she just, she won't have it. She just, she's paranoid that, you know, somebody will come in and break things or steal things from her storage units. So I really have to depend on her to finally get around to do it. And she keeps collecting more and more stuff. So I think, you know, she's in one of these storage units and she keeps getting pushed back further and further. So I just have to keep an eye, you know, and keep in touch with this woman who, you know, once owned him. And hopefully one day, you know, she'll come across her. No kidding. No kidding. I mean, you might have to wait till a day, you know, when she passes and those storage units go up for auction. Oh, my God. I know. That, crazy. You're, you better <laughs> you better bring a very large checkbook that day, my friend. Oh my god. Uh, it's like, you know, she's showed me photos of her storage and she's like, Yeah, this is like you know, we're all packed. I just don't know how, if I can get around to finding her. Like, well please do if you ever do, let me know. So she's got my business card, you know, pinned up behind her register, so if she ever finds her, she can directly get in touch with me. What about creeping her out a little bit more and saying, look, you know, we can calm Mr. Creepy down if we just find his wife. Have you tried that by creeping her out even more? Maybe I'll just threaten to bring him back. He's just too unruly to handle unless he finds his wife. So here you go. (laughs) That that may actually work. We we may be on to something here. You know, why not? Give it a try. I mean, because obviously, oh, yeah. you know, this has become a goal for you now. It's almost part of your mantra to get him or to get the dolls back together. I mean, that is just, I mean, you hate to you hate to think of it as romanticism in the entire paranormal subject, but that's almost what it's like. It is. It is. And, you know, it, it's kind of a heartbreaking story because I, I believe that's all he's doing. He's just looking around, trying to find out where is she. And it's sad that, you know, she's not willing to go the extra mile to help us, you know, to try and find her. But, um, you know, what can I do? It's uh, it's a situation that's out of my hands. But, I, again, you're right. I, I would love to bring those two souls together and help bring closure for them. You know, or at least be in a situation where, you know, even after my time comes, that they'll still be passed around as a pair. So they'll never be separated again. Yeah, no kidding. That's that's a tough, tough place to be in, in something like that, when your your hands are literally tied in the situation. Mm-hmm. So with that... Tell us about a few more of the haunted objects you have at Spooked in Seattle. Oh, we got uh, quite a few. I, I mean, people have been kind enough if they have anything of, of interest in their own homes are more than happy to donate it to us. Uh, we give them a good home and watch over them. But uh, let's see. Let me think of some other great stories. Since we're getting into Halloween, ooh, we have our demon doll. Oh, what's that? Now this is this is a doll that I came across on Craigslist, and the story is that this doll belonged to this family's great 
aunt. And when she was a little girl of nine, they claimed that she was possessed. And a local priest had come in and done an exorcism on her and stated that he transferred whatever was inside her into her doll. And then he put his rosary on the doll, preventing whatever it was uh, from escaping. So this doll has been passed on from generation to generation within this family to make sure that whatever's in the doll stays in the doll. So now it's the younger generation's turn to take care of this doll, and they didn't want it. So they posted an ad on Craigslist hoping that somebody would take this doll off their hands. Now, they didn't want any money. In fact, they were willing to pay whatever fees they needed to to get it to you safely. They didn't want any fame. I'm not even allowed to tell you the family's name. They just wanted to make sure that this doll was being looked after properly. So I told them that this doll would be behind glass. And they liked the idea that it was going to be in a museum behind glass, so they were fine with that. So since I was able to convince them that I would take this doll off their hands, they sent me the doll. Now, the doll uh, was put in this antique case. Now, it was one of those cases that uh, it usually takes about two people to pull away from the wall, especially when you have a lot of stuff inside the case because you don't want to disrupt everything. So you have to slowly pull it away from the wall. Then you could have access to the doors behind it, unlock the doors, of course, put the doll in the case, lock them, push the case back up against the wall. Well, I had done just that. And the next day I came in and I was going to introduce the doll, the new doll, to a few of the tour guides. And I noticed right away that the crucifix in the doll's lap was turned upside down. Now, I know when I set the doll up, it was right side up because, you know, I made sure it was presentable in the case. So I literally had to pull that case slowly away from the wall, unlock the doors, fix it, and then lock and push it back against the wall. It hasn't moved since. So I think that whatever's inside this doll just probably warned me that it's there. Scary. Oh, yeah. Scary, scary times, man. We also have a doll. Go ahead. ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say another doll that uh, people like um, me talking about is what we call our suicide doll. And this is a doll that was given to this um, elderly woman when she was just a baby. And this doll has been with this elderly woman throughout her whole life. And uh, in her later years, it sat on a shelf in her bedroom. And this elderly woman, unfortunately, passed away. And uh, her family was sitting around her when she was on her deathbed. And the moment that she stopped breathing, the doll fell off the shelf and shattered on the floor. And so we believe that once that connection was cut, the doll committed suicide. No way. Yeah. No. How much of this is actually real, Ross, and how much is just family legend and folklore? Well, all the stuff that I have, I I can tell you from what I've been told, you know, and again, some of these are just passed down to me from family members. This is their story. I'm sharing their story with you. Now, I cannot just say 100%, you know, is it true? You know, I'd like to believe that some of these people are telling me the truth. There, There's nothing to gain from them by just dropping off this piece of, you know, this artifact and then just walking away. You know, I'm not paying for this stuff. A lot of it's just, I just don't need it in their home anymore, done with it, and they want to walk away from the situation. They don't, you know, they're not giving me, in most cases, they're not even giving me their names. So I can tell you, you know, so-and-so's story and make them famous for that. So for me in that situation, I'd like to believe it is true because, again, they're not gaining anything from this. Right, right. No, I, I can see that. What do you think, then, where, 
as we only got about three and a half minutes left with you, about all of these haunted dolls or haunted objects that people can find on Craigslist or other social media sites like Kijiji, should people who are interested in haunted objects be purchasing them from there? Is there a lot of fakes and frauds? Oh, my God, there are so many fakes. Be careful. You know, it's... The the thing is, and me, and me and David even talked about this in our book, you know, Haunted Toys, is because, you know, haunted objects have become such a huge fad and people want to experience the phenomenon themselves. People have been known to pay big bucks for a doll that they have no clue if it's haunted or not. It's got a good story behind it. So, yeah, it's definitely going to be haunted. One of the things, and, and, what, and the, the story, I should say, that started this all was um, the doll's name, I believe, was Harold the Doll. And it was one of the first dolls to go up on eBay as a haunted doll. And that doll sold for $700. Was that so Anthony that, Kenyatta? I believe so, yeah. Yeah, there's a whole book and everything written about it and all that stuff, yeah. So the thing is is that started a huge fad when people realized that, you know, there are individuals out there willing to pay big bucks for haunted objects. So what I always tell people is, you know, don't always believe everything out there that when people are claiming they have haunted objects, because one of the things I first would look at is their, you know, seller's history. If they've sold, you know, a dozen of haunted objects, then I'm going to have to say that they're probably fake. So just be careful of that. You know, uh, there's a lot of people out there that have quite a bit of history of selling haunted objects. So don't always believe that. Ross, I want to say thank you so much for coming on Spaced Out Radio tonight for the week before Halloween and sharing some of your freakiest stories that you have investigated around North America. And, of course, you know I'm really really pushing hard to get you back up here not only for the museum but flight 21 barkerville maybe even if we're lucky to get in mandy the haunted doll again and hopefully i can find another one do me a favor (laughs) tell everybody where they can find your museum where they can find your work well i definitely want to encourage people if you are interested in any of my books uh you can find them on amazon under ross allison author and then, of course, uh, I always encourage people to follow me on Facebook. I've unfortunately reached my max on friends, but I definitely encourage you to follow me because you'll be able to know when I'm doing live feeds from haunted locations, which is always fun. See what I'm up to. Uh, you can also track down our website at a ghost.org. And then, of course, check out Spooked in Seattle at spookedinseattle.com. We are in the heart of Seattle in Pioneer Square. Very cool. Great location as well for the tourism. Ross, you have yourself a safe and happy Halloween. Much love from all of us at Spaced Out Radio here, my friend. Thank you for making a great show for us tonight. Well, thank you for having me, and you be safe out there as well. Absolutely. Ross Allison, everybody. Coming up next, we have the SOR News Wire and the Thought of the Day. Stay tuned. We're adding to the entertainment online for Spaced Out Radio. I'm Amber Beckard, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out Cryptid Tales, where I will take you on a journey into some of the strangest legends and lore from around the world, relaying the stories to you of the strange creatures and experiences that people have had throughout time. You can find Cryptid Tales at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our free archives and leave a comment. See you there. A little bit of science, a little bit of skepticism. Add a dash of snark and you have the makings of Spaced Out Sundays with me, Everett Thiel. Together we will look into the reality of the paranormal with an open eye and rational thought. Oh, did I mention there'll be plenty of woo as well? Your time spent with Spaced Out Sundays will make the night even better. The chat rooms are open, 9.06 p.m. Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern, right here at spacedoutradio.com. 
At spacedoutradio.com, we have a little bit of everything for you to stay up late. So while you're there, check out our SOR Newswire, where our team brings you stories of the weird and strange to the WTF from around the globe. News on Bigfoot, UFOs, paranormal, Darwinian-type crime tales. It's the stories that the mainstream media usually won't touch. Well, we got them all on the SOR Newswire, only at spacedoutradio.com. We all know on Spaced Out Radio we love a good beard and mustache, so why not take care of your facial hair with Mighty Moose Beard Oil? Made in Canada, we're taking care of beards and stashes around the world. We use 100% natural ingredients with our oils and balms to make your whiskers feel silky smooth. Use promo code SOR2019 at MightyMooseBeard.com today. Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. SpacedOutRadio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages to play on the radio or our website including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. Hey, Spaced Out Radio fans, it's John Rezik, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. Our goal is to make the life of veterans, first responders, and those with rare medical conditions 10% happier. We do this by donating one grant item, ranging from dance to therapy programs to prosthetic limbs, to those who need it most. To contribute to Spaced Out Radio's official charity, head over to chivecharities.org and become a donor today. Heading to Vancouver and looking for a night on the town? The Moose Vancouver is the bar that never stops rocking until 2 a.m. every night. The Moose has great food with everything on the menu from $6.95 to $8.95. Fantastic, vibrant staff and rock and roll that will bring you back to when the music was real, the hair was long, and the guitars were rocking. Get your party on at the Moose Vancouver, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. Move over, brother, and let me own Saturday night. This is Rich Giordano, and I'm inviting you to tune on in to Spaced Out Saturday starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, 12 a.m. Eastern, where I'm going to bust open the lids on everything paranormal. Why? Because we want answers, and I'm the guy who's going to deliver those answers to you. Join the chat rooms, and we'll see you this Saturday. Just be there. No, really. Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. Every night on Spaced Out Radio, we have places for you to hang out. Hi, this is Carl. Join our SOR Space Travelers group on Facebook for live chat. On Twitter, using hashtag Spaced Out Radio, you can also join us in our Spreaker chat room. Check us out on Instagram at Dave Scott SOR. All of our archives are free on YouTube at Spaced Out Radio. By the way, I'll be watching you at your window until you do. Bye! You wanted new SOR gear, and now you can have it. The SOR Vault is fully stocked with t-shirts, hats, hoodies, mugs, and everything in between with great logos for you to choose from. So head on over to spacedoutradio.com, click on the SOR Vault, and go shopping. Pricing is quite affordable, and you can look good representing your favorite show. So go to our website and pick up your new SOR wear at the SOR Vault today.
Hey, everybody. The SOR Space Travelers is open. For just 5 bucks a month, you can hang out with Dave and our crew privately in our members-only section. With your signing, you'll receive newsletters on what's going on with Spaced Out Radio. You'll have direct contact with the host during the show in our chat, live streaming videos, and a great forum for your posts and more. Become a space traveler now at spacedoutradio.com. Rounded third, we're heading for home tonight on Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. Great to have you with us. Reminder to all of you, if you've missed most of this show or others, go over to our YouTube channel. That's where we store our free archives at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you. You can rock out to Bumblefoot. You can become an SOR space traveler for 5 bucks a month. Purchase some SOR swag from the SOR vault. And if you're looking for a great book from a great author, head over to We Read the Night. Of course, there's always Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire, which is updated daily. Speaking of the news, let's get to it, shall we? The news is always changing, which is why we bring you the SOR Newswire at the back end of every show where we get to the weird, the strange, the WTF, and the odd time pretty interesting. Of course, all your news can be found at spacedoutradio.com. Now, I had to go a little heavy on the news today for the simple reason that this is the first time I haven't had anybody respond to the thought of the Dave. Usually we get between 20 and 40, sometimes 60 messages on the thought of the Dave. Today we got, I think, one on both Twitter and Facebook. It kind of shocked me because usually it's a pretty popular segment when we post that question. So I got to go a little heavier on the news today, so I hope you don't mind. But there's some good stuff out there, real good stuff. We're going to start off in Indiana where a worker at a resale shop discovered $7,000 cash in the pocket of a jacket. Now, luckily, they were able to track down the cash's rightful owner. Jennifer Kimes, who works at Plato's Closet Valparaiso, said she was examining a jacket that was recently brought into the store when she found something in the pocket. She says, When I put my hand in the pocket, I felt something. When I pulled the money out, it made me panic a little bit. So I put it back in the pocket for a second, and then I took it back out of the pocket and ran over and put it in the register and immediately called the store owner. She said the discovery was extremely unusual. She went on to say, I mean, sometimes you find gum or a picture or a grocery grocery list, but you never really find seven grand in a pocket. Kimes' boss, Tammy Wedland, was able to help her identify and contact the former owner of the jacket who had forgotten where his money was stashed. Just extremely overwhelmingly grateful, Wedland said. Kimes said she was happy to be able to help out and do a good deed at work. It's just about integrity, she says. So when you work with things like this, you have to make sure that you're honest and you do the right thing. Good for her for doing the right thing. That's a lot of money for somebody to lose. Now, if you're in Michigan, watch out for the cougars. No, not the stiletto kind. Wildlife officials in Michigan said two recent cougar sightings in the state's upper peninsula bring the total sightings of 2019 to five, and the animals are likely escaped or released pets. The Michigan Department of Natural Resources said a wildlife camera in northern Delta County recorded a mountain lion sighting September 18th, and a camera in southern Marquette County about 14 miles away recorded a cougar wandering 
gathering around October 6th. The department said a total of five confirmed cougar sightings have been recorded in 2019, and it's unclear whether all of the sightings involve the same animal. Cougars were once native to Michigan, but the animals were eradicated from the state in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Officials said the cougars spotted in the Upper Peninsula are likely pets that escaped or were released by their owners. They said there is also a chance the cougars migrated from the nearest known breeding population in the Dakotas about 900 miles away. That would be kind of cool. I mean, we have them in our backyard here at SOR headquarters. Not often. It's been a year since I've been growled at. Actually, it hasn't. On the 27th, it'll be a year that I got growled at. That still kind of freaks me out. Yeah, it was about 40 feet away. Didn't see it, because my backyard's pretty dark. Oh, that's a scary, scary feeling, man. Scary feeling. A Texas groom who robbed a bank a day before his wedding to pay for the rings and venue has been arrested. Heath Bumpus robbed the Citizen State Bank in Groveton on Friday morning, Trinity County Sheriff Woody Wallace said on Facebook Live. The 36-year-old threatened a bank cashier and said he had a gun before demanding cash. Bumpus told the employees that he was getting married and needed the money for the wedding the following day. He then left... Oh, wow. Before I even continue this... You know, if you're robbing a bank, you don't tell them that you're getting married and need the money for the wedding the following day. That may not be the thing that you want to say to them, because I'm pretty sure that those tellers who you're freaking out, who think they may die, they may tell the police that. So if you're a bank robber out there, don't tell them what you're doing the next day. Anyways, Bumpus then left with the stolen cash and drove down dirt and forest service roads when he received a call from his fiance, who he was due to wed on Saturday. His fiance said she saw surveillance videos, stills of her husband-to-be robbing the bank that the police had posted on social media. She managed to persuade Bumpus to turn himself in, and he confessed to authorities in Houston soon after. He basically stated that he was getting married tomorrow, so he didn't have enough money for a wedding ring that he wanted to buy and needed to pay for the wedding venue. The bank was located around 30 minutes away. From Bumpus's hometown, police said Bumpus threw his clothes out the window of his car and he drove away following the robbery. Mr. Wallace recovered his clothing as well as the gun used in the crime. Explaining the arrest, Mr. Wallace said in the video on Facebook, his fiance, who was supposed to marry him, was able to get in touch with him on the phone when she saw our post. She knew it was him. She contacted him and asked if he had robbed a bank. She convinced him that she knew it was him. Bumpus was still in custody as a Monday morning and has since been transferred to Trinity County Jail. Mr. Wallace added he has been charged with aggravated robbery. The district attorney has accepted the charges. It will go to a grand jury and he will be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. The sheriff said the most that most of the stolen money was recovered. Mr. Wallace confirmed that the wedding did not take place at all. This guy just ruined a good day. Ruined a good day. Westland, West Midland, Midlands police said it's the 10th time the motorist failed a test. Yeah. So this dude drives unsupervised to his own driving test, and he fails it. Yeah, apparently. And he drove to the examiner's center in a stolen car. 10th time he had failed. Yeah, West Midlands Police posted a picture of the white Mitsubishi vehicle the driver had turned up in before officers attended the scene. The driver was arrested on suspicion of taking a vehicle without the owner's consent at the test center in Birdbrook Road, Great Bar, around 11 a.m. The force response unit posted on Twitter to describe the motorist as stupid. Really? That's the most polite thing you could call them? Yeah, their Facebook post goes, Welcome to the world of stupid. Male turns up at the driving test center for his driving test, having driven himself there unsupervised, then fails his test for the 10th time. 
Arrested by D Unit Newtown. Yeah, stupid. Absolutely stupid on this guy's part. I don't think they'll give him an 11th time. But, you know, this is the kind of guy where he's determined. Okay, he's determined to drive. And eventually that's going to hurt someone bad. If you're an Apple Watch user, you might have some luck here. Apple Watch saved the lives of hikers by calling 911 after a mountain fall. Yeah. James Prudenciano slid down a cliff and was rescued when his watch called emergency services. The man was hiking in New Jersey when he slid down a cliff with his date and landed on a secluded ledge, thought the two were stranded. That was until his Apple Watch caught signal, sprang into action, and on its own called the police. Yeah, James and his partner are avid hikers, so they didn't think anything of tackling a challenging mountain trail on the mid-month of October 14th. No, no, no. This was something normal for them. But the two sensed they were in trouble when they realized they were lost and the sun was starting to set. Yeah, first, James's friend slipped on the thorny vines that she couldn't climb back over because of a steep incline. He went to rescue her, but the two saw the mountains was way too steep to climb up or down. But they tried for two hours to find a way to safety. James had lost his shoe, so he suggested they sit and slide down the mountain as he had been trained. They both ended up sliding farther than they thought they would, landing hard on different parts of a ledge. My leg was twisted, and I was already hurt. I had a thorn that went way through my foot, James said. I didn't see much. All I seen was rocks. He said he was trying to figure out his next move when he heard 911. What's your emergency from his Apple phone? or his Apple Watch, pardon me. Three agencies responded. According to Middletown Police, the hikers were brought to safety by a civilian boater who offered to help. James suffered a fractured back and injuries to his leg and foot, while his date sustained minor injuries. They fell about 30 feet. Yeah, well, that's an experience. So make sure when you go out in the wilderness, you use your Apple Watch. Tens of millions of voracious purple sea urchins that have already chomped their way through towering underwater kelp forests in California are now spreading north to Oregon, sending the delicate marine ecosystem off the shore into such disarray that other critical species are starving to death. A recent count found 350 million purple sea urchins on one of Oregon reefs alone, or more than 10,000% increase since 2014. And in Northern California, 90% of the giant bull kelp forests have been devoured by the urchins, perhaps never to return. Vast urchin barren stretches of denuded seafloor dotted with nothing but hundreds of the spiny orbs have spread to coastal Oregon where the kelp forests were once so thick it was impossible to navigate some areas by boat. The underwater annihilation is killing off important fisheries for red abalone and red sea urchins and creating such havoc that scientists in California are partnering with private business to collect the overabundant purple urchins and ranch them in a controlled environment for ultimate sale to global seafood markets. It's a good looking sea urchin too. How much meat can they have on those? A Virginia County has reversed a ban on sleeping in cars overnight. Yeah, apparently the reversal by Roanoke County comes after months of backlash over the February ordinance that, Yeah, reports say the ordinance was decried by people who said it infringed on personal liberties and created additional hardships for those without stable housing. Officials have said the ordinance was meant to allow the county to intervene in unsafe situations. Holland's District Supervisor Phil North echoed that, adding that authorities never planned to punish offenders with the fine specified in the ordinance. No one was ever charged under it. North says there is no point defending an ordinance the county didn't intend to apply. County Attorney Peter Lubick says the public's opinion influenced the reversal. Good, you could go sleep on a bench again. You imagine sun tanning, you fall asleep, you wake up with a ticket? Yeah, apparently. 
A nonprofit that combats disinformation campaigns says it hopes the research and reach thousands of U.S. journalists for training in the next few months with the help of a $1.5 million donation from Craigslist founder Craig Newmark. The donation to First Draft was announced Thursday. The group said it is making free training available to newsrooms and will conduct 14 simulations of news events to show how reporters can recognize and stop the flow of bad information. Citing Russia's effort to influence the 2016 election through various means, including the spread of false or misleading stories through social media. First Draft's Claire Wardle said journalists need to be alert to interests who will try and avoid detection and find weaknesses in the flow of information. Wardle and her sister Jenny Sargent co-founded First Draft. In recent months, a manipulated video of House Speaker Nancy Pelosi has spread online. A false Twitter rumor claimed a mass shooter displayed a bumper sticker supporting Democratic presidential candidate Beto O'Rourke, and there was a call to boycott a restaurant chain based on an incorrect report that it was supporting President Donald Trump. There has also been a spread of websites that look like local news outlets, but spread stories based on a political point of view. You know what? Maybe let's just try this for a second. Instead of training the journalists to spot fake news, because that's what college is for. Maybe if they just reported the real news. Let's think about this. Maybe if they reported the real news, this crap wouldn't be going. And maybe if people wouldn't read such smut just because it sides with your political or personal affiliations or beliefs, it would be better. But journalists have to do a better job at covering the news. It's not about the fake news. It's about journalists actually doing their job. Maybe if they did their job, we wouldn't have the, another Band-Aid that will get ripped off. How about we try that? Let's start that at college. Maybe that'll work. Or how about we make sure that media outlets don't try to politically influence their readers, viewers, or listeners? Might be a thought. I, I could be out of tune with that, but it might be a thought. Nutrients found in orange rind and orange pith. Oh, I love the word pith. That's a good word. Are getting closer to a closer look from researchers in Texas and Florida as mouse studies show the benefits for heart disease and cancer. New uses for oranges, especially underused parts like the rind, could help revive Florida's signature agricultural crop. Crops in recent years have been one quarter of the record highs set in the 1990s due to disease and storms, but overall impact with jobs and suppliers is still estimated at over $10 billion. Mice who were fed an extract from orange peels at University of Florida's research station for citrus didn't get overweight and avoided heart disease compared to other mice. University scientist Yu Wang has received a $500,000 grant from the U.S. Department of Agriculture to study the impact on humans. See, this is good money spent. Not like trying that we had the one yesterday where they were teaching the rats how to drive. We're actually spending money that will help people here and maybe prevent heart disease. Orange peel is has been used in Asia for many years for medicinal uses, Wang said. We know that if we treat mice with orange peel extract, it can control weight and reduce fat accumulation. Oh, God. Maybe I should start eating some orange peels here. Some alternative medicines advocate in the United States have touted extracts or nutrients found in orange peel or orange pith. Yeah, let's just call it pith from now on. The white spongy layer under the orange surface, but it has been used mostly for flavorings or livestock feed. Citrus was first grown in Asia thousands of years ago and brought to Florida by early Spanish colonialists, according to research published in the Journal of Nature. But native diseases and pests that evolved with citrus in Asia also arrived in Florida, particularly citrus canker and citrus greening. Both diseases are widespread and considered epidemic in Florida now. Edward Snowden says, no, there, there ain't no aliens. Yeah, before revealing how the National Security Agency was spying on Americans, Edward Snowden apparently searched for evidence of aliens in the government systems he had access to. Says he didn't find any, which might have been good to know before the Storm Area 51 event. The former NASA or NSA contractor and whistleblower appeared on the Joe Rogan Experience and in more than two hours worth of interviews, Snowden touched on many subjects, including one that's a favorite of Rogan's, 
aliens. Snowden said to Rogan, I know, Joe, I know you want there to be aliens. If we are hiding them, I had a ridiculous access to the networks of NSA, CIA, military, and all these groups. I couldn't find anything. If it's hidden, and it could be hidden, it's hidden really damn well, especially for people on the inside. Florida man knocked out Olaf. Yeah, Florida man was arrested for allegedly sexually assaulting an Olaf stuffed doll of the wildly popular PG-rated Disney movie Frozen. This happened in a Target store. Cody Meter is accused of placing the popular snowman on the floor and dry humping it until he ejaculated. At Pinellas Park store around 2 p.m., according to the arrest affidavit, Meter then found a stuffed unicorn in the store that he allegedly dry humped before cops arrived. Cops say he admitted his dirty deeds. They were done dirt cheap to cops, saying he did stupid stuff on Olaf. Meter's father told cops his son has a history of this type of behavior. Cops charged Meter with criminal mischief, and he said the stuffed animals had to be destroyed. He now has a restraining order from all Disney products. Want to say big thank you to Captain Shirk for putting our news together tonight. She did a fantastic job. I know I had to add a few more stories, Captain. Don't be upset. But literally, the thought of the day was a dud. i got to remember never to ask that question again. Big thanks to Ross Allison for coming on in as well, for coming in to tell us some great haunted stories from his 20 years of investigation. We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thaw rocking in the background with Little Brother is watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio, rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody listening in at home, in your cars, at work, in our chat rooms, on the SOR Space Travelers Club, on our website, on Facebook, Spreaker, Revolution Radio, LGAB. And hashtag Spaced Out Radio on Twitter, wherever you may be. I know you're out there somewhere. Please remember, this show is copyright by Spaced Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you for sharing your evening with us, because together, my friends, we're watching. We own the night. Mr. Bumblefoot, we need a favor. We need you to take us home. Have the best night ever, everybody. We're going to do it all again tomorrow. My final show of the week before Rich and Everett take over for the weekend. See you tomorrow night for the SOR Roundtable. Good night.